Welcome to the Reichauer Center for East Asian Studies at Johns Hopkins University, SICE. I'm Kent Calder, uh, the director of the center, and we are pleased today to present a joint webinar with the Asian Development Bank on the subject of meeting the challenge of COVID-19. As our keynote speaker today, I'm honored to introduce President Masatsugu Asakawa of the Asian Development Bank, who is speaking from Manila. Before joining uh, the ADB, President Asakawa served as the longest serving Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs in Japan's history, and is a graduate of both Tokyo University, and also I am pleased to say, of Princeton University, where we worked together many years ago. President Asakawa, it is a real pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Calder. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, uh, good morning, good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar uh, jointly organized by the Johns Hopkins University and the Asian Development Bank. Uh, focused on meeting the challenge of COVID in Asia. It is clear uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic is the main challenge facing the Asian region and the world today. Vaccines now gives us hope uh, that we can gradually turn the tide of the pandemic and rebuild our strong recovery. But we are not out of the woods yet. We must focus our efforts now so that the recovery can be lasting and available to all, including the poorest and the most vulnerable in our societies. Since its founding in 1966, ADB has served as Asia's leading regional development bank. Uh, we provide strong and reliable finance, practical knowledge solutions, and partnerships among a wide range of stakeholders to our developing member countries. Today, I will provide an overview of the short-term economic outlook for developing Asia and describe ADB's continuing support to our members during this time of crisis. I hope my slides is shown on the screen. So slide two, please. Yes, uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues uh, to unfold, its enormous economic and social impact is becoming clearer. Preliminary data show uh, that the region is experiencing its first contraction in six decades. Developing Asia's GDP contracted in 2020 last year by 0.2%. And this is a substantial decline uh, from 5.0% from growth uh, in 2019. However, Growth is forecast to rebound to 6.8% this year, 2021. A prolonged pandemic still poses the main risk to the economic outlook, but as I mentioned earlier, recent vaccine developments and rollouts are reducing this risk. Next slide, please. The Asia Pacific region is extremely diverse encompassing countries with very different income levels and stages of development. As a result, the region figures mask differences in COVID-19's impact across countries. Growth is expected to rebound this year due to base effects and assuming continued progress in con containing COVID-19. Commodity exporters that were hit by lower demand and prices last year will benefit this year from the recovery in commodity markets. But prospects for tourism dependent countries like Maldives and Fiji are subdued as the recovery from the collapse in global tourism will be very slow. ADB recently calculated uh, the losses from COVID-19 COVID relative to a no COVID scenario. We conducted this analysis factoring in decline, declines in domestic demand and tourism and global spillovers as of December last year. 
for developing Asia, pandemic-related losses in 2020 are estimated to at 1.4 to 2.2 trillion US dollars, or 6.0 to 9.5 percent of our regional GDP. South Asia experienced deeper losses relative to other Asian subregions, in large part due to the prolonged lockdown in India, but hardest hit economies are small tourism dependent countries, as I mentioned. Turning briefly to the region's largest economy, the PRC, PRC contracted in the first quarter of 2020 when COVID-19 emerged, but economic activity returned quickly. PRC's growth was 2.3% in 2020 and is expected to expand by 7.7% this year. From 2022 onwards, the PRC will return to the moderating growth trend seen pre-COVID. And PRC policymakers are balancing growth uh, with other development priorities, including reducing fiscal and financial risks and making growth greener and more inclusive. So now let me turn to how ADB has responded to the COVID-19 crisis. ADB announced a $20 billion support package in April last year. By the end of last year, 2020, we had committed $16.3 billion out of this package in the form of grants, technical assistance, and loans to developing member governments and the private sector. A major form of ADB's support is aimed at addressing the tremendous shortfalls in the fiscal revenues governments are facing due to lockdowns and other pandemic containment measures. To help fill those budget gaps, we introduced a new instrument, new financial instrument called the COVID-19 Pandemic Response Option, or CIPRO in short, which has provided much needed counter cyclical finance, financing, budget financing, until economies can get back on their feet. Our CIPRO financing is supporting policy measures that facilitate targeted aid to households and firms most severely affected by the pandemic, among other key priorities. Our CIPRO commitment in 2020 totaled $10.2 billion to 26 countries, as is shown on the upper, 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 upper half of this slide. As I noted earlier, developing Asia has experienced a wide range of impacts uh, from the pandemic. ADB's long and trusted, trusted presence in the region has enabled us to respond uh, to the specific challenges in each of our developing member economies. This includes our immediate response through various grants and technical assistance to address the urgent health crisis and our support also for the private sector. We are also able to coordinate and mobilize additional resources through our close cooperation with developing partners. So far, we have secured more than $10.9 billion in co-financing for the pandemic response. Let me now turn to another measure that is absolutely necessary for our region to overcome the pandemic, swift and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. ADB will play a major role in the global vaccination effort through our new Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility or APVAX in short. This $9 billion facility will complement and reinforce the efforts of our development partners across the world. We will focus our efforts on supporting ADB's developing member governments as they procure and distribute safe and effective vaccines to their populations in a fair and equitable manner. Our facility has two components, a rapid response component for procurement of vaccines and a project investment component for investing in systems and capacity for vaccine distribution. The safety of vaccine, vaccines is a fundamental priority. ADB financing under APVAX will be used only for vaccines 
that have undergone technical and scientific review processes in line with international best practice. The vaccines produced by BVAX must meet strict criteria as indicated in this slide to be to the eligible for financing. Country must also satisfy the criteria shown here as a access criteria in order to be able to access the BVAX facility. We announced this facility in uh, December last year and in January uh, this year, ADB committed 25 million uh, to the Philippines uh, to procure eligible vaccines by expanding the scope of our existing health sector projects. In addition to the Philippines, we have to date received requests to access this, this APVAX facility from many countries, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, India, Indonesia, Maldives, Mongolia, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Tajikistan. To ensure the effectiveness of our APVAX facility, as well as to inform other vaccin vaccination efforts, ADB will provide technical assistance for needs assessments, policy advice, capacity building, and implementation support. ADB will also support the private sector, including through trade and supply chain finance, and with support for uh, storage, logistics, and distribution of vaccines. Slide eight. All of these efforts will allow us uh, to look beyond the pandemic as we, re we return to path uh, towards a pro prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. Let me conclude today's presentation by highlighting five areas where ADB will support, ADB, ADB will support this brighter future for the region. First, we will help to deepen regional cooperation and integration so that our developing member countries can seize the opportunities of renewed globalization. We are doing this by enhancing regional trade and investment, diversifying supply chains, and strengthening regional health security. Second, we will continue to address inequality, including gender inequality, through focused investment in human capital and social protection, investment in education and health. These investments will also help restore earnings, remittances, and consumption across economies. Third, we will promote green infrastructure as economies rebuild. These investments can boost economic activity and generate jobs, while also strengthening climate resilience and mitigating the impact of climate change. Despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, ADB remains committed to deliver $80 billion in climate finance cumulatively between 2019 and 2030. Fourth, we will help to harness the benefits of digitalization. The pandemic accelerated the transition to the digital economy. To capitalize on this, Asia must enhance digital infrastructure, close the digital divide, and safeguard cybersecurity. Last but not least, we must strengthen domestic resource mobilization. The pandemic underscored the need for adequate and sustainable tax revenues. Governments must close our potential tax loopholes, including those arising from the digitalization of the economy, and they must implement other reforms to better tap the domestic resource needed for sustainable growth, effective response to future crises, and achievement of the SDGs. To support these efforts, ADB announced a new uh, regional hub for domestic resource mobilization and international tax cooperation last September. Okay, so let me stop here. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, President Asakawa. Uh, Masai, if I will, a sincere thanks for your remarks and your 
outline of the substantial challenges that Asia's economy uh, now faces. We also appreciate your review of the important steps that uh, ADB has taken, uh, including I, I was especially impressed with the uh, new vaccine facility, APVAX, a $9 billion commitment, I, I understand. And also some of what you said about the earlier support, very large support package, um, the CIPRA package earlier. Um, Today, as you know, we have a full schedule. We appreciate the, your having uh, many of your key economists participate with us, and we certainly look forward to that. So thank you very much. I thank you. appreciate you with us. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to uh, introduce Ambassador David Shear who uh, recently served as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, uh, also uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia in the United States, and for 30 years as a senior officer of the Department of State with a wide range of portfolios, senior portfolios uh, relating to uh, China policy and, and also Japan, of course, as well. Uh, and Ambassador Scheer, who's serving now as a senior fellow of the Reischauer Center uh, here at Johns Hopkins SAIS, uh, he will chair the next panel, which concerns exiting the COVID crisis. Thanks very much, Ambassador Scheer, for being with us. Thank you very much, Kent, and it's a great honor to join our distinguished panelists today in, in this discussion of exiting the uh, COVID crisis and what comes next after that in panel two. I'd like to start by announcing that my wife and I got our first vaccination shot today and we considered going out to celebrate but thought better of it uh, shortly thereafter. Um, but uh, as the needle went in, uh, I felt like I was seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, panel two today will be addressing the light at the end of the tunnel and what that looks like, but we've got to get out of the tunnel first, and that's what panel one is here to discuss. Joining me are four distinguished panelists. I'm going to introduce each when their turn comes. I'll uh, add a few comments after each presentation. We'll, I'll kick it off with a, uh, a question for each of them, and then we'll open the, the uh, floor to questions, uh, which you can contribute via the Q&A function. So with that, I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo first. Dr. Nuzzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, and the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations and published a very useful and informal, uh, informative article in the January-February number of Foreign Affairs magazine, which I recommend to all of you. She is an epidemiologist by training. Her work focuses on global health security with a focus on pandemic preparedness, outbreak detec detection and response, health systems as they relate to global health security, biosurveillance, and infectious disease diagnostics. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Nuzzo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. And I really appreciate it. Thank you to the organizers for including me in this really fascinating conversation. Um, and I'm very grateful to be able to talk about these issues with you. I'm gonna go ahead and show my, uh, share my screen so that I can show you some slides here. I would like to show you some data. And what I'm going to talk about is sort of where we are now, where I think we're headed in the near term, and then what is to come in the future. So with respect to where we are now, um, one of the roles that I play is I'm a part of the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, which is a very large site that encompasses a lot of COVID-related data tracking efforts, including what you may have seen before, this global map that was started by my colleague, uh, Dr. Lauren Gardner, who is at the Johns Hopkins um, Whiting School of Engineering. 
she started this as a bit of a research project to collect data um, as it was coming out on, on COVID cases for her own infectious disease modeling efforts. But it has gone on to become a site that many people turn to in order to get an up-to-date uh, case count and to track trends. And once the university realized how many people were relying on it, they invested a lot of resources in order to be able to um, shore it up and, and add some functionality to it. So, you know, just showing the global picture of where we are now, um, about a year, more than a year into this pandemic, 115 million cases reported uh, worldwide by 192 countries. Um, but, you know, to the point about um, potentially seeing a light at the tunnel, I do call your attention to the bottom right hand corner, which shows the daily case numbers. Um, unfortunately, in the last uh, few days to weeks or so that, that they've started to bump up, but where we are now is um, noticeably better than where we had been. And, and I think that's an important um, sign of progress. Unfortunately, we are seeing some a rise in cases um, in, in some parts of the world, um, possibly related to um, some of the variants. And that's something I'm going to talk about in terms of what um, that means. But um, I think it is important to recognize that there has been some important declines and, and potentially signaling um, a new sort of chapter in this pandemic. I'd also call your attention to that. I don't know if you can see it might be small on your screens, but there's a kind of very tall spike on one day. And one of the kind of overarching lessons from this pandemic is that, first of all, different countries have been affected quite differently, but also how we understand how countries have been affected and, and the extent to which they have been affected is really quite challenging because we don't have the kind of standardized data collection that we really need to be able to answer those questions. So that very tall spike that happened on one day was because one country changed how it was going to classify cases and then added a bunch of historical cases. And that is unfortunately something that we've seen since the beginning of this is that countries are counting cases differently. They're looking for cases differently. They're counting deaths differently. And yet it all kind of gets tallied up, but really we're not dealing with exact apples to apples comparison. So when we have these assessments of, of how hard we've been hit, I think it's important to keep in mind the kind of limitations of the data. Deaths, I think, is one important area to, to keep in concern, to, to keep this in mind, because um, the ability to find deaths, while um, perhaps a bit more of an easier endeavor than doing widespread testing to identify infections, still is a capacity-dependent process. You know, in order to test somebody that has died, in order to say that this was a death due to COVID, that there's an inherent capacity there. And we have now seen um, in post-mortem analyses from countries that look to be um, spared or largely spared, that the truth may not exactly be what we think it is in part because of the lack of testing that has happened. And just to show you the heterogeneity in testing, and I focus on testing because that is the start of all of this. That's the process by which we identify infections and call them cases really countries are all over in terms of their approach to looking, using tests to identify infections. And so what we're showing here is incredible diversity in terms of um, the numbers of tests that countries are performing. The, um, the, the size of the shapes here um, are, are tied to the level of infections that countries have been seeing. And so you'll see that some very large uh, circles um, are occurring in countries that have performed, um, you know, relatively fewer tests per capita than, than other countries. Um, in that instance, usually the, the number of positives of, of the test performed come back um, high. And, and when you see a high test positivity in countries, that usually means that they're missing a lot of infections and they're not counting them as cases. They're only testing the sickest of the sick. So again, a real challenge in sort of understanding how different countries have been affected by this virus. Um, variants are obviously on our mind, and um, this is, I think, another challenge for us in the sense that um, we talk about these variants and often talk about them in the context of the country that first identified them, but have to recognize that there are huge discrepancies in how completely and how much countries are actually doing sequencing to look for genetic variants. And unfortunately, the countries that are usually the first to identify the variants are those that are doing the most sequencing, the ones that are looking the hardest for them. Then what happens when we become concerned, like here in the United States, which had been relatively, you know, towards the bottom of the pack in terms of the amount of sequencing, you know, of, of all the cases that we had had, the amount of sequencing that we were doing was, was quite low compared to many other countries. Um, when we start then to become concerned and start looking for them, 
we begin to find them and that gives the impression that you know the the frequency with which we're finding them is increasing when reality is we're just starting to shine a light on what might have been there doesn't mean that they aren't also increasing but it's hard to tease out initially so with that sort of what what do i think is going to happen in the the next um, few weeks to months ahead the first important obvious story, and I, and I like the anecdote that was um, shared um, by Ambassador Shear at the beginning with, you know, getting the vaccine as, as feeling like, you know, a light, um, sort of a light at the end of the tunnel. And that I think is going to be the dominant story for, for our path out of this pandemic. Um, countries that have been more aggressive in rolling out vaccines, I think, frankly, have an easier path ahead of them. The case numbers in the United States have been falling, and they've been falling quite precipitously. And in my view, that is likely due to some level of behavior change, but given the different approaches and the fact that US states today are you know, lifting all sorts of societal restrictions such as mask orders and other things, more likely what we're seeing is the product of people no longer traveling for the holidays combined with high levels of natural infection, combined with um, a relatively rapid uh, rollout of, of vaccines to the point where now more than 10% of US adults have been fully vaccinated. So that just puts, I think, a country like the United States on a different trajectory than countries that uh, locked down early and managed to prevent um, large numbers of infections and yet still aren't, um, still aren't seeing vaccinations. They will remain vulnerable um, if they and and could see a rise in, a, in infections if they release any of the measures that they had been using to keep their case numbers at bay until they um, more fully vaccinate their their populations unfortunately as this graph shows us and this is from bloomberg and i it's their accounting as of today there are huge holes as we know in who has access and who has been using vaccines and this was an analysis my colleagues at the Council on Foreign Relations did, just looking at um, which vaccines were being used in different countries. Again, it's really interesting to see the mix of vaccines being used, as, as is, of course, the, the holes that are um, the uncovered parts of the world that we remain um, quite worried about. And then, of course, you know, analyzing who is using vaccine, of course, this falls along um, economic lines, as is probably not surprising to this group. So we have to very much worry about the disparities that we're seeing, not only in, in ability to access the vaccines, but also, um, uh, you know, that we may reinforce the, the, the divide between um, high income and low income countries. Then, of course, if, if we are able to, um, you know, uh, solve the supply issue of vaccines, which is which is you know quite a challenge um, going forward given the demand for, for vaccines. There is also the fact that even if countries are able to gain access to vaccines, that um, there may be a population that is not fully willing to receive the vaccines. And you know, I think in previous years this might be something the idea of of misinformation or disinformation being spread to um, increase vaccine hesitancy. I think in previous public health emergencies, we may have sort of discredited this as a bit of a fringe element and probably not central to the main issue. I have to say, I think we would be really, we would be gravely mistaken if we were to do that um, this time. We have been tracking the political aspects of the response to COVID and the, um, the organization that anti-vaccination groups have been employing to not only sow doubt about the COVID vaccines, but using COVID vaccination and perhaps um, hesitancy that otherwise pro-vaccine vaccine, people who are pro-vaccines might have um, because this is simply a new virus and a new vaccine, to, to use this as an opportunity to increase the share of people who are uh, vaccine hesitant. So I think this is something that we absolutely need a strategy for. It is, it is certainly a challenge here in the United States where we're hearing that you know, large percentages of healthcare workers, say nursing home um, staff who have seen firsthand the devastation of this virus. In some instances, some reports that 60% of staff in some facilities have refused the vaccine. And, you know, this is really a global problem spread in part by, by social media and, and other worldwide platforms. Um, and we very much need to, to factor this into our response and have plans for, for combating it. I mentioned earlier the, the variants, um, but when we think about it globally, I mean, the overarching lesson is that 
Um, the longer this virus is allowed to continue to spread, the more opportunities there are for mutations to occur. The more opportunities there are for mutations to occur and the possibilities that these mutations could have traits that we don't want, like increased transmissibility or increased severity or reduced receptive, um, susceptibility to vaccines and therapeutics. So this really creates urgency around our actions to um, reduce the spread of the virus. And also it creates a situation where no country will be truly safe until all countries are safe. I mean, this is just an epidemiologic fact at this point. It's a, it's, a, it's a moral issue for sure, but it's also a pragmatic issue, which is that if we leave pockets of the world unprotected, it could come back to us in the form of genetic variants that no longer, um, you know, that are able to overcome vaccines and that, you know, we would ne then have to think about revaccinating people, which is I think something nobody wants. So um, I, I think finding genetic uh, mutations among RNA viruses is not entirely surprising. Nonetheless, having seen them recently is really a wake up call for our need to act with even greater urgency to control the spread of this virus. So um, ending there, I do think that there is potentially a light at the end of the tunnel. We have become, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have vaccines that are working so well at defanging the virus, taking away its ability to um, uh, you know, cause severe illness and death. And that is an, an important feat. And countries that have been able to, to roll out the vaccines, I think will be in a much different state in the, in the months to come um, because of that. That said, you know, there's that saying, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel may be a train. <laughs> and I think in this instance, we have to consider what the potential trains might be, which is that, you know, this pandemic that we find ourselves in right now has been incredibly challenging. It's been described as a once in a century pandemic in the sense that the last time we battled something this challenging was the 1918 influenza pandemic. But we would be gravely mistaken if we assume that we, after living through this, have about 100 years of downtime before the next challenge. The reality is more and more we keep seeing the emergence and spread of new pathogens. And we have to plan that this is going to continue to happen. The global conditions that allow the emergence of this are, are, are favoring the continued emergence of these viruses and these pathogens. And so if it feels like these, these sorts of things are happening more frequently, it's because they are. I mean, we have the data, even when we account for, for improvements in surveillance, we are finding more and more viruses and that's because of global conditions, both political and environmental. So we have to plan for the fact that new viruses will continue to emerge. And, and the way to deal with them then is to think, well, okay, they're going to emerge and they may cause outbreaks, but whether those outbreaks will become epidemics or pandemics is very much up to us and, and whether we have the capacities in place to be able to contain the spread. And we also have to factor that if, if we fail to contain the spread, we should expect to see considerable harms. Now, living through COVID-19, that's quite obvious, but I do want to um, identify that there are multiple ways that this virus has harmed us. There are, of course, the very obvious direct effects from the virus. There are the slightly less obvious, but it will become obvious in the, the coming years, the impacts from health services, the regular routine care that were interrupted because of the virus, either because health systems were overwhelmed handling COVID cases, or because of countries' measures aimed at slowing the spread of the virus. And that caused an interruption in the routine and preventative health services that um, people would otherwise have, have had access to. And then there are, of course, the economic tolls of this virus. And um, that has you know, ex ex um, extended beyond the direct impacts in terms of healthcare costs and the impacts of people becoming ill, but also the, the costs of national responses and lockdowns and other things. Um, there was one early estimate that was published in um, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association by, by Larry Summers looking at the cost to the United States. And I was really struck by how much it was estimated this pandemic could cost the United States. And this um, was an estimate as of um, early last fall. So possibly we've even eclipsed it by this point. Um, but nonetheless, compare, I just, we did the back of the envelope um, calculation to what Larry Summers estimated um, this pandemic will cost the United States in terms of healthcare and you know, other costs, um, longer term impairments and lost GDP. 
to what the United States has spent on preparedness. The United States, which has made relatively large investments in preparedness compared to some other countries. And I mean, you can see, you know, in the span of, of nine years, the US spent about $9 billion in total on, on various preparedness programs. And yet a single event is estimated to, to exceed $16 trillion in, in costs. So you've probably heard people talk about the cost of preparedness is cheap compared to the cost of response. And I think, you know, it, it um, doesn't always take a once in a century feeling pandemic to show us that, but unfortunately that's what we're very much seeing right now. So just going forward, I mean, I think one of the biggest weaknesses that we need to focus on fixing is our health systems. One of the projects I run is um, the Global Health Security Index, and we published the first index in October of 2019. And what we found uh, in that analysis was that, first of all, no country was ready for an event like this. But in particular, national health systems were the weakest link by far across all countries, and it's the place where health systems um, lost the most points. So when we saw country after country having to lock down out of an acute fear that their health systems were going to be overwhelmed by a surge in, in infectious uh, patients, that was not surprising given how um, under-resourced nearly all health system is and under and, and underprepared for, for events like this. So we very much need to, I think, as a matter of, of focus, invest in our health system so that they are more resilient um, in, in the face of events like this. And the WHO prior to this pandemic had articulated this vision where we build on the very important work of health system strengthening, which I will tell you is largely a completely separate field from the people who have been working on preparing for infectious disease emergencies. In fact, there's very little crossover between these two fields. Experts in both fields don't really know each other. National efforts lar largely don't talk to each other. It's just it has always been quite separate, but I think COVID has demonstrated quite acutely why there is an intersection there that needs to be um, strengthened and we need to work uh, in, um, in conjunction with each other so that we build on the work of each other because again, if we only you know, give countries laboratories uh, to detect, um, you know, to, to be able to test um, you know, clinical specimens in a pandemic, but they're not equipped with the clinicians that are needed to collect the specimens to send to those laboratories, these countries are not going to be prepared. So I will end there. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuzo. Can everybody see me? There we go. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuzo, once again. And congratulations on the success of the uh, COVID dashboard. Um, it's certainly gratifying for me to be associated with an institution on which so many people throughout the world have relied for good information on various aspects of the pandemic. So uh, we, we are grateful to Johns Hopkins for providing that fantastic resource. Secondly, thanks for also reminding us that while there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's a good bit of tunnel left and a lot of complicated issues that need to be addressed, both to, both to get through uh, the current pandemic and to address future pandemics. Um, and I have a personal sense of how hard it is to prepare for future uh, pandemics. When I was the deputy chief of mission at our embassy in Kuala Lumpur, we conducted a tabletop exercise on a global pandemic with some uh, folks from Washington to help us. And um, the global or, or the, the national health systems broke down, global travel broke down, and American embassies abroad had an extremely difficult time getting clear directions from the US government on what to do next. And I think that was in 2007. And uh, I think all of those have been strongly in evidence uh, um, in, in the current pandemic. So that, for me, that, that's a big lesson on, on the need for stronger preparedness. I'd like now to turn the floor over to Dr. Eduardo Banzon. Dr. Banzon is the Principal Health Specialist, Southeast Asia uh, Regional Department at ADB. He is a champion of universal, universal health coverage and has long provided technical support to countries in Asia and the Pacific in their pursuit of this goal. Dr. Banzong is a principal health specialist, again, at, at, uh, in the Southeast Asia Regional uh, 
department at ADB. And before joining ADB in 2014, he was president and CEO of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. He was World Health Organization Regional Advisor for Health Financing for the Eastern Mediterranean re Region and WHO Health Econo WHO Health Economist in Bangladesh. He has also been a World Bank Senior Health Specialist for East Asia and the Pacific Region. Dr. Banzon, thank you for contributing your great expertise and experience to our panel tonight. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, allow me to share. Good morning. I'll be talking about vaccine production and distribution with particular focus in Asia and the Pacific. I think one of the things that we have seen, uh, and by the way, uh, is that what COVID has done is something like Usain Bolt in the Olympics, you know, an extraordinary speed that we've never seen before. So we've seen really an extraordinary speed in how vaccine is being developed. If you see the slides on the right, that's basically the time period in which vaccines used to be traditionally developed. We used to say 15 years before we could actually get a vaccine on, available to people. Now we have actually seen the vaccine, of course, it's an emergency use in less than a year. But more than having the initial vaccines being developed, we're seeing the vaccine development really flourishing all over the world. In Asia, in particular, among the leading vaccines, uh, we have countries in our developing member countries, uh, PRC, uh, India. We're hearing from Vietnam, also from Kazakhstan, that they have now really moved forward in developing vaccines. So this is signaling really, for me, a renaissance in vaccine development and in investment in interventions against communicable diseases, the diseases that affect quite a lot of our DMCs, and hopefully this will be continued on after COVID. What else have we seen? Massive investment in vaccines. We haven't seen this before, although uh, of course it's driven by the fact of the economic impact that uh, COVID-19 has really brought upon, but this is really something for us in the health sector, a challenge to make sure that we could continue to get countries and governments to continue this investment in vaccines and not just vaccines in health systems development, because as highlighted, it's more than vaccines, it's also about health systems. Now, what's quite interesting is that as we like, try to look into how this development is doing, and, and this is a slide that I got from uh, uh, sort of a summary that our friends from UNICEF got, and we have seen really the production scale up. You know, a lot of the projections that was given before when the vaccines were being developed, you know, I think every day we're hearing new numbers, new projections that basically showing how this ramping up in manufacturing is, is, is uh, basically overtaking all of these projections. One of the things that we have seen is really partnerships, partnerships between uh, phar pharma companies, vaccine manufacturers that weren't there before. So if you're following, of course, the media reports, our friends from Johnson & Johnson has gotten their Janssen, uh, and Janssen has gotten their vaccines approved. But more than the fact that they gotten this authorization is the fact that Sanofi, which is a competitor of J&J &J and Merck, these are two of the largest vaccine manufacturers in the world, have decided to manufacture the J&J uh, slash Janssen vaccines. And of course, more than that, they also brought in one of the leading manufacturers in India, Biological E, to do that. We have also heard, of course, the story of Serum Institute of India, the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world in terms of volume. Uh, they, in a sense, they even claim that 65% of all children in the world has at least one dose of vaccine that comes from SII or Serum Institute of India. They have partnered with AstraZeneca for the, their vaccine. They're now manufacturing that vaccine, supplying not just COVAX, but they're also helping their neighboring countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia basically ramp up, start up, initiate their vaccination even before COVAX. And of course, the second partnership that's coming is with Novavax, where they recently announced Novavax and COVAX with Serum Institute of India, a deal that they will provide up to 1.1 billion doses of vaccine. So as we could see here, the partnership is really, you know, you have competitors who were competing against each other, working together now to uh, manufacture vaccines. I hope that this is the 
how do we call it, the environment, the business environment that we will see in the future as we address, continue to address COVID-19 and other future pandemics. Uh, it's health, uh, this is a, a public health issue that, that, will, that would require the private sector to treat it like a public health concern, like a public health emergency. That means they have to stop competing but working together. It's very interesting, for example, Johnson, the jo Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, the partners that J&J uh, &J has, has partnered with from Sanofi, Biological E, uh, Catalant. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a partnership that's all over uh, Asia, uh, uh, Europe, and the UK. It's also something that we are finding quite great in Asia. In Asia, uh, there are, well, if we put Australia, six, about six countries that are, in a sense, been manufacturing vaccines for quite some time. And their vaccines have been quite, their production has been quite gross. The regulatory authorities are a little lower than the stringent. Uh, they're, they're essentially tagged as what we call functional national regulatory authorities. And they have been, a lot, their vaccines has been pre-qualified, of course, by WHO, which means it's being bought by the UN system, particularly UNICEF, to be given to children. Because as we know, vaccine most was mostly a childhood vaccination program in a lot of developing countries. Of course, there is adult vaccinations in, other, in a few of these countries and more of the developed countries. So it's quite interesting that this uh, new in paradigm, new, new, new ecosystem that we're seeing in manufacturing, the, our countries in Asia with functional national authorities are also being bought in. We already told about the Star of India where, where uh, Biological E and Sherm Institute has been bought as partners. But there are other uh, strong Indian vaccine manufacturers that are now being partnered, like Hetero, and of course we're closely following up other uh, other uh, manufacturers in India. In Korea, of course, the AstraZeneca that we will be getting here in the Philippines uh, or ADB's headquarters, and in a lot of other countries, would be coming from SK Bioscience, which was partnered with by AstraZeneca. In Indonesia, of course, uh, Biopharma, which has about more than ten or more, I think more than ten of these vaccines already pre-qualified is partnering with Sinovac. Novavax is working with Takeda in Japan and of course in China in addition to the vaccines that they're developing, which is uh, Sinovac, Sinopharm, and CanSino, uh, there's partnership with Foson, with Pfizer, BioCantai, with AstraZeneca. So we're seeing this uh, partnership happening also among Asia and the Pacific. But what's more interesting is that it's actually opened up the potential, and this is my region, Southeast Asia, of uh, vaccine manufacturing, expanding vaccine manufacturing capacity in other Southeast Asian countries from, uh, from Vietnam, or in addition to the vaccine that they are already developing on their own, they actually have vaccine, they're already manufacturing vaccines. So we could see uh, the different, different platforms that they could potentially be partnered with uh, in Thailand. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about Indonesia already. And there's also vaccine manufacturing in Vietnam. So there's, act there's actually opportunities now for us to explore that. Now, what more are we seeing in vaccine manufacturing and uh, distribution is regional and global cooperation. Of course, this is not the full story. Okay, and I didn't want this to put in the slide the fact that a, a substantial amount, significant amount of doses has been locked in by upper income countries. I rather look at the positive side. So COVAX has been a system that's great. It's, 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 it's going to provide, looks like it's gonna fulfill its promise. So about 2 billion doses to about uh, is developed mostly developing low income and low or uh, in a sense developing member countries of Asia, low income and low middle income countries. But what's more interesting is the fact that remember these two billion doses will be funded out of donations coming from a lot of developed countries, OECD countries from the US, Germany, the UK. So this this is a global partnership that needs to be supported and strengthened. But it is not just COVAX that we're seeing. We're seeing, for example, in South Asia. Well, as I said, where India has basically donated COVID Shield, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine made by Serum Institute of India to Bangladesh, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, and well, it's they even donating beyond South Asia, including in the Caribbean and, uh, and uh, Mauritius and Sea. So, quite a lot of countries. We're also seeing the same uh, regional cooperation, for example, with donations that's being done by PRC by China to countries, including in the Philippines and Cambodia. So where are we now with uh, vaccination in Asia and the Pacific? And I hope you could see this slide. 
So this is as of yesterday. It's quite difficult, as, as, as was said earlier, on tracking this because there's really no global system with the same uh, indicators, with the same, which require countries to submit. So we have to capture this information from various sources. But nonetheless, as of yesterday, report and, 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 and you, if you use Bloomberg or use the world in data, which I think the two best uh, websites, if you call it that, or institutions that are aggregating this information, PRC or China has now more, has given more than 50,000 doses and they're using three vaccines. Uh, and there's about 25 countries now among ADB's regional member countries that has gotten the vaccine, that has started administering the vaccines using a range of vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna uh, in, in Sinovac and, also, uh, and the as Oxford, sorry, the AstraZeneca. And as I said earlier, the COVID shield, uh, the, uh, which, which was donated by India. So it's quite interesting how uh, we are much behind because if you look at it globally, global is 265 million. And, sorry. and if we look with a different measure, okay, much more difficult measure to get, which is share of people with this one dose, and if you look at the color of the, uh, and the darker it is, that means the more percentage. And if you look at some of the countries that been people are talking about, Israel and United Arab Emirates, which are among the two leading countries, there's a lot more work that's needed for us in Asia and the Pacific to catch up, to start distributing the vaccines. So can we do that? Uh, our, our ERCD, yes, who basically his team uh, with Xin Yang came out with a recent paper to look into the uh, uh, into how, how to basically assessing the ability of countries to roll out a COVID-19 vaccination. It's quite interesting to that among those that they've measured is, is something they pick up, I think, from Deja, I'm sorry, where, where they, they basically talk about cold chain logistics. Okay? And we know that vaccines need cold chain. And the more that your cold chain system is ready, the more than then once you solve the problem of getting the vaccines, you could actually flow the vaccines in into the system. And so in Asia and the Pacific, Asia, Asia, except for Mongolia, with the, uh, we basically the countries are ready. Southeast Asia is doing quite good, except for Timor Leste and Myanmar. We need a lot of work to be done in the Pacific, but it actually shows, in a sense, that you know the cold chain system of Asia and the Pacific is not that unprepared. I think that's a good word, and we're really we're in a position to help improve this. A second thing that we need to look into, and, and I'll just probably focus on these two, is, is addressing, let's say, vaccine hesitancy. Now, this is a wonderful slide that I pick up. And basically here, uh, the, more, the more blue you are, sorry, basically means that uh, you are, countries are, more people in the country believe that vaccines are safe, are important and effective. So this is 2015, this is 2018. So we've actually seen, if you look at Asia and the Pacific, becoming more blue, okay? So this is, in a sense, it does, it, for me, it highlights the fact that vaccine hesitancy, yes, is a problem, but that's not a problem that cannot be solved. And as what President Massa has presented, ADB has launched the AFVAX facility to respond to this, to bring in the vaccines, to help the coaching system, to help address vaccine hesitancy. Ambassador? Thank you. I'll end there. Thank you very much, Dr. Benzo. Again, despite all of the storm and stress between China and the United States regarding COVID and all of the storm and stress related to the US withdrawal from WHO, it's really extraordinary, I think, to see the level of international cooperation, both among governments multilaterally and uh, between private sector entities as well. Um, and the, not only has the, the development of the vaccine itself been extraordinary, I think, but the level of co international cooperation has also been um, very impressive. Um, also impressive was the level of the U.S. contribution to COVAX. I was unaware of that, and, and um, I, I'm glad that we have indeed contributed um, heavily to multilateral efforts to um, uh, develop and distribute vaccines. Uh, one question I'll have for you at the end of this is where was China on that on, on that graph? Are the, it's clear that 
China has a very active vaccine dipl diplomacy program. And it looks like that may be bilateral, but perhaps the doctor can, can uh, straighten me out on that. But before we address that question, I'd like to turn to Dr. Jessica Fanzo to talk about food, uh, uh, food, food security in COVID. Um, Dr. Fanzo is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at, at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, the Bloomberg School of, of Public Health, and the NHTSA School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She also serves as the director of Hopkins Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and is director of food and nutrition security at the JHU Alliance for a Healthier, Healthier World. From 2017 to 2019, Jessica served as the co-chair of the Global Nutri Nutrition Report and the UN High-Level Panel of Experts on Food Systems and Nutrition. Her research expertise includes the impact of transitioning food systems on healthy, environmentally sustainable and equitable diets, and more broadly, on the livelihoods of people living in resource-constrained places. Thank you much, very much for joining us, Dr. Fonzo, and I turn to you. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador Shear, and to Kent Calder for inviting me to be a part of this really fantastic panel. I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm gonna talk about the impacts of COVID on food systems and, and of course food security and a little bit on, on nutrition. And hopefully later we'll have uh, Professor Martin Bloom who will also be speaking about, about food systems as well and, and the path forward. Um, so you know, COVID has really had quite an impact on food systems. Um, and we know that COVID uh, really uh, is a zoonotic disease that originated from the changes that we're seeing across food and agriculture. Food and agriculture play a big part in the rise of zoonotic disease because agriculture expansion, um, we are either destroying habitats or we're shrinking habitats or we're moving wildlife from those habitats. And when we think about zoonotic diseases, 60% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And of that 60%, 70% originate in wildlife. So the food and agriculture system is dramatically uh, threatening uh, wildlife uh, and, and increasing the risk of, of zoonotic disease emergence. And you can see in this map here on the right, a hotspot map showing you the estimated risk of zoonotic disease emergence. And you can see Asia lights up yellow as being very, very high risk. Now what's happening with COVID and food systems and the impacts on people's lives? And like Jennifer had articulated about the lack of, of data or the inability to uh, get quality data or reliable data or we're suffering the same issues when we think about the impacts of COVID on the food system. We don't really know yet the short and long-term impacts. A lot of studies are happening right now, empirical studies to look at the impacts of COVID on livelihoods and food systems, but a lot of them are ongoing. They're not published. We don't have a lot of real-time data. And even the data being collected is done by telephone or online surveys. So some of that data has to be interpreted with caution. So we're really in a phase of holding our breath and, and hoping that the models that are, have been suggested of the potential impacts on COVID into the long term won't be as bad as they're predicting. Um, I think many of you have uh, seen a lot of these economic impact models. Uh, on the left is showing you some, some modeling from IFPRI where they estimate about a 20% increase in the additional, additional number of, of, of poor, of those who are falling into the extreme poverty with Asia not being immune to that, about 15% increase um, in, in the 
the uh, those who are suffering from extreme poverty and we do know that the food system workers the food sector workers are significantly affected by covid the inability to get to fields to to work on fields the inability to move food around the world um, and what you see here on the right is from an Asian Development Bank policy brief showing you um, the risky areas of work. And you can see across different subregions of Asia, agriculture, forestry, and fishing is significantly threatened with uh, both men and women workers being uh, threatened for their livelihoods. But we also see a lot of impacts on those who work in processing plants, those who work in food service have been uh, more at risk for being infected. So the, the functionality of the food system and its dependency on a healthy workforce will continue to be impacted until, as um, our two other colleagues had talked about, uh, vaccines are, are in place everywhere in the world. We know now that food prices are starting to increase. We're seeing a, an increase in most places in the world. This is showing you the darker the blue, the increased prices since February of last year of 2020 of the 14 major food products. You can see Asia again is not immune to this with uh, rising food prices and rising food price volatility which creates significant food insecurity risk and coping strategies for many families and communities. And some new modeling suggests that it won't just be uh, related to calories and food security, but burdens on overall nutrition and human development will be significant in about 9.3 million additional children could become wasted or acutely malnourished and about 2.6 million additional children will be stunted, chronically malnourished, which can have lifelong impacts. And this has huge costs, societal, health, economic, and educational costs. And uh, this is a modeling exercise of, of a very pessimistic to a more optimistic scenario. But regardless, we're going to see reversal in some of the progress made to reduce malnutrition. And there's many different ways COVID can impact the food system through lockdowns, labor shortages, infections that can stymie, delay, or decline food production, the ability to move food, the ability to, to uh, purchase food. And so there's a lot of different work going on to try to understand the multiple pathways in which COVID is impacting food systems. But some of the early lessons of that we've learned from COVID, the first is that governments can actually take notice, act with speed, and often can act in their own interests when threatened, as we're seeing with the vaccine. For those of us who've worked in hunger and climate change, in which governments have taken very little action and sometimes openly disregarded, it's incredible to witness and see that when governments are threatened, they will act quickly, which is a bit of a surprise from, from my own work of not really getting a lot of government attention. Um, another big lesson is that the we are all in this together type problems, climate change, uh, COVID requires strong public institutions and cooperation. And we've seen a uh, waxing and waning of, of different countries in, in, in coming to the table to solve problems collectively together. We've also learned that food systems dance in a complex uh, societal system. Um, this was a shock to the global health system that's had huge implications on food systems. And there's been many lessons already about the food system, stabilizing food systems, keeping trade open and flowing, supporting, protecting, and valuing food system workers, ensuring our food supply is safe, regulating illegal sales of wildlife and global food trade. These are all lessons that we knew before, but COVID has really uh, shown a light on, on these things uh, and the vulnerabilities 
of food systems. But we have the opportunity to reorient food systems. We had the UN Food Systems Summit coming up this September. So all eyes are on how do we build better, equitable, healthy, fair food systems. And Asia has its challenges. It's got climate change and population pressure, high burdens of undernutrition compounded with obesity and non-communicable diseases, but it has incredible opportunities. It's as, as, as uh, Mr. As uh, Asakawa had said, it's incredibly diverse in its culture and traditions. It has a growing middle class, incredible youth, driving innovation and change, uh, an amazing natural resource base, including blue foods. And so it's a real opportunity for Asia to build back better food systems coming out of COVID-19. All of the innovations and technologies are there. It's a matter of political will and attention being drawn to food systems in this time of COVID-19. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fonzo, for that very interesting discussion on the intimate links between pandemic disease and food security. Um, it, it's clearly um, a, an issue that that needs more attention, um, particularly in relation to the COVID crisis. And we're looking forward to, I, ho I hope, increased American efforts in the multilateral community on this subject as well. With that, I'd like to turn to our last speaker, Dr. Yasuyuki Sawada, who is the Chief Spokesperson for ADB on Economic and Development Trends and leads the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department which publishes ADB's flagship knowledge product, products. He holds a doctorate degree in economics and a master's degree in international development policy from Stanford University, a master's degree in international relations from the University of Tokyo, a master's degree in economics from Osaka University, and a bachelor's degree in economics from Keio University, also in Japan. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Soada. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a warm uh, introduction, uh, Ambassador Sia. So let me uh, upload my uh, slide. I hope you can see my slide. Let's try show. Um, so from me, I'd like to discuss uh, reopening of uh, Asian economies. And um, let me move on. So first, um, um, let's um, um, quickly go over uh, COVID-19 situation. Um, uh, since Dr. Nuzo explained in detail the other issues, um, um, one thing, uh, important message was that we need to be cautious about these numbers, but uh, probably uh, I, I, I think that this is useful for capturing uh, overall trend. So left chart uh, summarized uh, global uh, comparison of uh, COVID cases uh, in daily uh, 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 time trend. And um, uh, we can see um, COVID-19 has continued to spread globally, uh, especially um, uh, US in yellow line um, uh, on its third wave, and also Europe in, is on uh, second wave. Uh, left chart, Asia is uh, shown in uh, uh, blue. And uh, uh, to con contrast to other countries, things have has either stabilized or improved uh, in Asia. Uh, and uh, this is shown in the blue line on the right, right chart. Uh, left chart and the right hand chart shows the sub regions in uh, Asia. Uh, South Asia still accounts for the bulk of our uh, region's cases, but it has been declining uh, substantially. Uh, Southeast Asia hasn't improved much with number of, uh, still climbing up to uh, some extent. Uh, Central Asia uh, orange has declined and uh, there has been a uh, rise in the cases in East Asia, but now uh, they could uh, control, seems to be control over all uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, diffusion. So uh, let me um, uh, turn uh, to um, uh, uh, reopening issues. Uh, in order to look at the uh, overall re reopening pattern, uh, left chart uh, showing a uh, time trajectory of stringency of containment policies. Uh, Oxford University uh, has been uh, releasing daily 
uh, stringency uh, index of the government comp cont uh, 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 containment measures. Uh, they uh, compile um, information such as uh, uh, workplace closure, uh, school closure, and social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Then um, uh, there is aggregate index of uh, uh, stringency of containment policy for each country. So we can uh, utilize this uh, daily index. Uh, despite the uh, continuous spread of COVID-19, um, uh, we can see uh, most econ economies, left, left chart showing that uh, most economies have uh, relaxed containment measures and reopened economies. Uh, strict lockdown was uh, uh, very sharp um, um, uh, around April, May uh, last year, according to the left chart, but uh, then uh, we can see um, uh, gradually relaxed uh, uh, these uh, measures. Uh, we see sharp drop in stringency in containment policies very recently, especially um, uh, according to the left chart, particularly in uh, Central Asia and South Asia seems to be uh, uh, relaxed a lot, uh, the uh, 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 lockdown policy. Right chart shows the uh, mobility level or economic activity. Again, uh, in order to grasp uh, daily uh, economic uh, activity level, we can utilize uh, mobility uh, innovative uh, data, mobility analytics uh, data. Uh, so right chart showing uh, aggregated figure for each subregions of Asia. Uh, since containment policy has been relaxed, uh, initially uh, you can see April, May on right chart, uh, there is a really a sharp drop in uh, economic activity level or mobility level. But uh, since the containment policy has been relaxed, we see uh, some sign of recovery in recent uh, uh, weeks. And um, uh, this figure basically show economies have, have been reopened, uh, but uh, at the uh, varying uh, degrees. So uh, let's zoom up uh, different uh, countries, individual countries. Um, uh, I'm afraid this um, uh, chart is a bit, slide is a bit busy, but uh, actually we can see a few elements uh, 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 deciding uh, opening uh, uh, procedure or opening uh, progress. In this chart, purple line, so this is uh, eight country uh, data. So each chart shows the uh, uh, daily uh, uh, evolution of uh, 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 containment policies, and the mobility as well as uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, purple line showing um, uh, timing, uh, timeline of stringency level and the uh, orange line shows the mobility level or economic activity level. And the gray bars are uh, COVID-19 uh, cases. Overall, we can see uh, uh, there is a seemingly um, uh, clear trade-off between health measures and uh, economic activities. For example, uh, Second uh, from the uh, uh, left uh, top is India. So let's look at India and also uh, second from the left uh, in bottom uh, segment, Philippines. So let's look at the India and the uh, 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 Philippines. So uh, these two countries, uh, shortly after the outbreak in March 2020, government ab adopted a very stringent uh, uh, lockdown. So public line showing a sharp increase in uh, 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 containment uh, and uh, stringency level. And, um, and then uh, at the same time, we observe uh, uh, sharply suppressed economic activity um, showing in a sharp drop in orange line. So maybe, I don't know, you can see my arrow. So, so this uh, indicates um, uh, there is a, a clear trade-off. Uh, lockdown has been relaxed over time then, so leading to higher level of mobility or economic activity. So orange line has been um, gradually uh, improving back to the pre-COVID-19 situation. Um, then we saw a surge in COVID uh, cases, especially in September and October last year uh, in India and the uh, uh, Philippines. Uh, this also forced government uh, to fine tune the containment policies. So, and then um, that uh, turn in turn affecting uh, uh, activity or mobility level. So it seems to be there is a, a clear uh, trade-off, but uh, we can also observe uh, some country uh, really uh, wisely avoided uh, such a seeming, uh, seemingly inevitable uh, trade-off between health and uh, economy by adopting a, a digital measures, uh, especially digital measures on uh, test uh, tracing and quarantine uh, uh, procedure and uh, 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 structure. Um, uh, one uh, example is uh, Republic Korea. Uh, top right end uh, uh, is uh, Republic Korea. Uh, uh, top right, uh, we can see overall activity level remain 
uh, very high, orange remain uh, very high, despite the high stringency level. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, COVID cases have been uh, quite uh, kept low. So uh, I think this also indicates a digital-based uh, smart lockdown uh, seems to be the key for the effectively opening economies without the fueling uh, uh, COVID uh, infection. For um, uh, external uh, 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 domain, uh, as we have seen from uh, President Masa uh, Asakawa's uh, keynote presentation, overall uh, developing Asia's growth uh, will, de will de rebound uh, this year, as we, we have seen uh, from the uh, President uh, presentation. Uh, we see a similar pattern in uh, external reopening of Asian economies. So this is a real export of the world and a group of three, um, uh, US, uh, Euro area and Japan, uh, as well as developing Asia. Developing Asia's uh, net export uh, uh, change is shown in a green line. After contracting in 16% year on year in May last year, uh, Asia's export, again, and this is shown in a green line, have recovered uh, strongly, quite strongly. The region's recovery has been uh, boosted by uh, strong uh, exports of health and medical equipment, including uh, 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 face masks and uh, other uh, uh, PPEs, uh, as well as exports of uh, electronics and uh, home goods, uh, which is uh, 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 based on the high demand for uh, 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 you know, work from home arrangement and stay home uh, 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 protocol. So during pandemic, we uh, we already seen a strong bounce back uh, uh, latter half of uh, uh, last year. Having this set, uh, not all uh, is uh, rosy on the external front. Tourism exports remain abysmal uh, as the pandemic and associated travel restrictions remain in place. Uh, as we can see from uh, these two charts on uh, international tourist arrivals in various developing Asian economies. Tourist arrivals uh, dried up in April 2020 last year and have not recovered at all. So actually, uh, this is a really a challenge how to reopen, uh, especially external front, how to reopen the country for uh, people's uh, movement. So let me uh, wrap up uh, in ending. Uh, as was ir illustrated uh, from uh, a few angles, a uh, variety of elements will shape each country's reopening and recovery in this year and the next year and onwards. I think uh, they, uh, the main risk is a prolonged pan pandemic, uh, extended first wave or recurrent waves, which can derail recovery and undermine stability in some uh, economies. Um, and for reopening economies, uh, actually optimization uh, over essentiality of the sector and health risks of uh, different sector, as well as economic importance of different sector. I think uh, optimizing three elements of essentiality, health risk and economic importance is a key to sequentially uh, reopening uh, the, each uh, different sector. And um, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Fanzo highlighted, uh, agriculture is uh, essential uh, with uh, relatively less risk, according to our uh, research. So, for example, agriculture should be prioritized for reopening. And um, uh, of course, um, uh, moving uh, forward uh, to uh, post pandemic uh, new normal, I think uh, we should also uh, uh, consider uh, not returning back to the uh, uh, same uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, situation, but uh, we have to aiming at uh, build, building back better, especially building back greener, uh, as well as uh, uh, more building back uh, more inclusive. So that's uh, very important. And in this front, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Banzong highlighted, uh, uh, vaccine uh, rollout, that's very, very uh, 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 critical and uh, uh, deciding uh, the uh, uh, reopening uh, 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 picture of uh, each different uh, countries and um, uh, also uh, recovery of external demand. So Asia now we see a, a strong bounce back of uh, uh, exports, but uh, these exports are also um, uh, determined by uh, uh, non-Asian countries' uh, uh, recovery. So external demand and terms of trade, these uh, elements are also uh, decisive element. And um, uh, also uh, under this um, uh, rather stringent uh, COVID um, uh, uh, containment policy, 
um, uh, uh, policy responses to support the government is uh, support uh, the um, uh, people's uh, livelihood and uh, uh, businesses, especially micro and uh, small businesses, are critical. Um, uh, according to uh, our uh, policy database, so si since April last year, uh, every twice twice months we have been compiling uh, policy packages. Uh, uh, announced and uh, uh, started implementation by uh, each different uh, countries. Uh, this is, um, uh, 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 we have a website, ADB COVID-19 policy database, putting everything, um, uh, policy package. And according to this database, uh, total amount of policy measures uh, uh, announced so far is as high as 3.7 trillion US dollars among de developing Asian countries. And uh, half of them uh, are devoted into uh, fiscal measures to support the uh, uh, income uh, of uh, families and also uh, revenue of uh, businesses. So I think uh, these uh, policy responses are very important when uh, deciding a reopening uh, priority and uh, sequentially reopening different sectors. But at the same time, um, uh, uh, COVID-19 inevitably caused an enormous um, uh, economic uh, cost. Um, uh, so I think uh, fiscal and financial vulnerabilities, uh, we need to carefully uh, uh, monitor and also intervene. And um, uh, of course, uh, digitalization, rapid digitalization, uh, this is uh, other element, how uh, we can uh, organize and support uh, uh, reopening. Uh, in a different uh, uh, phase and uh, uh, towards a new normal. Uh, digitalization, um, I think uh, this, is, um, uh, this involves a positive element. Uh, many people uh, who can fully utilize uh, digitalization, even uh, uh, staying at home, we can enjoy uh, different foods and different services. But at the same time, there are a group of uh, families and uh, people, uh, as well as the uh, businesses, which cannot really um, uh, uh, fully utilize a digital platform. So I think a digital divide, uh, uh, government uh, should really uh, carefully, uh, 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 you know, tackle uh, uh, many challenges arising from uh, digital, digital divide. So with that, uh, I'd like to stop my uh, initial uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Ambassador Shiba. Thank you very much, Dr. Sawada, and thank you in particular for, well, it's a very thorough uh, presentation. Thank you in particular for your data on the relationship, uh, relationships among stringency, mobility, and uh, infection rates. Th those relationships are certainly intuitive, but your graphics make it, um, make it much more, make the uh, relationships mu much more tangible. And it will certainly be interesting to see to what extent this uh, level of stringency and a speed of uh, return of mobility affect longer term uh, economic competitiveness, particularly uh, uh, among the, the countries that did well, like Vietnam, South Korea, Australia, uh, for example. So thank you very much, Dr. Suwada, for your great presentation. I'd like to start with our question period now. And uh, just to kick it off uh, very briefly, I have uh, a question for each of our panelists. I'd like to start with Dr. Nuzo by asking, um, by asking you uh, about WHO and the American withdrawal. Uh, to what extent did the withdra American withdrawal from WHO affect, uh, affect the uh, effectiveness with which the organization worked after our withdrawal? Was it, was it severe or, or how bad was it? WHO? So I don't think the impacts were direct, um, but I do worry about the larger kind of more indirect impacts of sending the signal that the organization is not essential <laughs> and should be the global coordinator of all the efforts, undermining the norms of global cooperation and, um, you know, creating the expectation that because the organization perhaps isn't quite aligned with what an individual country thinks it should be doing, that that is, you know, a time to remove, that the country should remove its support. Um, you know, I think we also did some damage by asserting um, that WHO did and didn't do things that were just simply not true, that we didn't have warning when in fact, you know, it was never made public, but it was, 
you know, an open secret that the United States had staff working at WHO um, at the very beginnings of um, of this now pandemic. And so, you know, this idea that we weren't getting information and we weren't getting warning was just simply untrue. But the consequences of that lie, I think, are, are not insignificant in the sense that, um, you know, I think there are many people who believe that um, this organization was completely subjected to politics. Now, I think there um, are, you know, reviews that need to be done, but I think the, the peril of a single country making allegations before a review has been done is one that we should not ignore. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you know, that the agreement that we all have to look for cases and to report them in a timely manner is an important but tenuous one. And um, it is uh, mostly uh, enforced through will and, and, and norms. And to undermine that, I think, really puts all of us at risk. Thank you very much for that very candid uh, answer. Dr. Banzom. Um, uh, it, it's clear that uh, ADB has been very active in, in uh, providing vaccines to your members through the AppVax program. To what extent is AB, ADB also working on the issues of rollout and distribution in those countries? Uh, Ambassador, okay, so we're in the, we're in, we are starting to provide the support to our, our our country. So we're, what's what's the problem? Okay, I think uh, one uh, oh, like like obviously lots of other countries the ultra cold vaccines. So these are the vaccines that require ultra cold chain logistics. Uh, there, that's something that countries automatically uh, say that they have difficulty uh, because that's not a usual way in which we 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 distribute or store vaccines. Uh, second, of course, is that remember this is adult vaccination, and most of our countries are used to childhood vaccination. So since the natural response of the countries is to piggyback or build on the existing childhood vaccination, trying to address now childhood vaccination is uh, adult vaccination a little different, you know. So they're they're, they're trying to manage that, you know. Uh, and children don't do walk in and demand for the vaccine; adults would. Okay. Uh, third, of course, this is essentially a campaign type. You know, if you if you're familiar with the polio vaccine campaign, the Mrs. Vaccines, you know, this is a, this is a, something which your health staff is really designed in most of our countries for routine vaccination. That means you spread out the vaccination for the whole year. Now you're gonna compress it. So shifting to campaign mode of vaccination for the next six months or so would be a challenge. So finally. A lot of our, our countries are not using digital technology at the level that we want to. You know, a lot of vaccines, the reporting going up is usually aggregates, right? You expect the health center to manage the individual level vaccination, then you just report up. Now you want all of this data, individual level data, in a, in, in a, in a database to be managed and all that. That's a challenge, but we're seeing our countries respond to it. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Fascinating. And very very big challenge. Dr. Fonzo, um, thanks again for your presentation. I'm wondering, we, we've seen the extent certainly to which WHO has taken the lead for the UN family in addressing the health uh, aspects of the COVID crisis, but to what extent is the World Food Program engaged? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, there's several UN agencies that that uh, work on food and nutrition and WHO does, but uh, World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization and EFAD, the, these sister organizations all sitting in Rome, take the lead on, on dealing with uh, food security and nutrition. And uh, Martin Bloom, who will speak later, was the chief of nutrition at World Food Program for many years. So he can speak intimately of WFP. But WFP is essential right now in delivering safety net social protection programs for the most vulnerable and the most food insecure. So their job has never been more important, but you know, they're underfunded. The whole global humanitarian uh, pool of funding for COVID is an underfunded mechanism 
Um, and so there's a real need to, to support WFP right now, even though they won the Nobel Prize and they've been recognized for their outstanding work. Um, there's a need to still uh, fund th their work because be even before COVID, they were dealing with multiple crises, multiple conflicts, natural disasters related to climate change. So their portfolio of work and burden has just been amplified during, during the COVID times. Thank you very much. Dr. Swada, one, qu one question for you. We've seen an uptick in inflation concerns in the United States over the past week or two. Uh, I'm wondering um, if you can address the, the outlook for inflation in the region. Certainly, the US government has been pumping a lot of money into the economy. We're going to pump some more in. I expect uh, re governments throughout the region are doing the same. Tell us about the uh, prospects for inflation. Oh, yes, uh, inflation, inflation is a um, um, uh, uh, big concern uh, related to uh, Dr. Fanzo's um, uh, presentation, especially uh, in the process of uh, uh, COVID-19 recovery. If a uh, speed is really fast, then uh, there could be uh, some risk, a uh, potential risk of uh, inflation. But uh, so far, um, uh, at this moment, uh, uh, as far as the developing Asia is concerned, uh, we set a rather uh, moderate inflation level. Uh, the, uh, uh, last year's inflation was at uh, 2.8%, and this year uh, we envision um, um, uh, even uh, uh, slowing down to inflation rate of around uh, uh, 2%. Uh, there are a few elements um, um, uh, because um, uh, de depressed demand due to COVID-19 uh, um, seems to be dumping uh, inflational pressure. And uh, previously, uh, African swine uh, flu, uh, especially in China, uh, has been a really a uh, push factor of uh, uh, meat price and food price. Uh, that, that was a major concern for uh, inflation in developing Asia. But uh, uh, this risk seems to be uh, really uh, uh, mitigated at this uh, moment. So I, I, I think um, um, uh, we are not so much uh, concerned about the inflation uh, as far as the developing Asia is concerned. But again, uh, having said this, I think um, a speed of uh, uh, recovery and um, uh, a reopening, uh, there is a potential risk of inflation. So I think uh, government can fine tune uh, fiscal as well as a monetary policy uh, to um, uh, uh, soften the negative, negative pressure of uh, uh, looming inflation. Thank you very much. Kent, uh, do we have time for one question? I've got one question on the Q&A on panel here. Yes, just very briefly. I think we, yeah, uh, very briefly. Great. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it'll be a quick, it'll be a quick uh, question. Dr. Banzong, I think this is a question for you. And uh, if I, if I understand it correctly, the question is, uh, what's the difference between the APVAX and COVAX, COVAX problem? And why, why do we, uh, uh, what's the rationale for having two such programs? Okay. Uh, Ambassador, APVAX basically gets, got money they pulled the money, then so they then they started contracting with the vaccine suppliers so they could provide the vaccines to about 92 uh, countries, including 29 DMCs. Then they got money also for those who wants to buy on their own. AFVAX will help countries put money into COVAX. Okay, because COVAX required a cost share. So part of the AFVAX financing to countries would be to pay the cost share. If countries wants to buy additional, the so-called self-financing route or the top-off part of, AF, of COVAX, then AFVAX can also finance that. Thank you very much. Kent, back to you and to panel two. Thank you very much, panelists. It was a great, it was a great uh, conversation, I think. Thanks very much, Dave. I, I agree with that. I heard that with a lot of interest. You know, the, often we think that vaccines are really the key, and that's all that uh, there is uh, to be concerned about now. But we've heard so many additional uh, structural issues, the whole question of agriculture and uh, the issues that it uh, creates, even within vaccines, the new ecology that's emerging in manufacturing. Um, a whole series of things. I'll, we'll come back to those later, but I must say, I think there was a lot that was new and very important in what we've just heard. Um, for our next panel, 
um, I would like to introduce as the uh, chair of that panel, which is going to be considering the Great Reset in Asia, the structural changes that we began to hear about. As our chair of this panel, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph uh, Zveglich, who goes by Joe, uh, who's currently uh, Deputy Chief Economist of the Asian Development Bank. He has served as Director of mac Macroeconomic Research, uh, Principal Planning and Policy Economist uh, at the Strategy Division of the ADB. And before uh, he went to uh, the ADB itself, he was a instructor in at the Harvard Institute for International Development, the HIID in Cambridge, Mass. And he has his PhD from Harvard University also. So a, a, a broad, broad range of backgrounds, uh, strong technical strengths, uh, the perfect person to speak about the structural changes that we're now confronting uh, as with the COVID uh, pandemic route moves to its conclusion. Uh, Dr. Zveglich, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Professor Calder. Um, as mentioned, the discussion in the second session uh, will be more forward looking. Uh, so we've assembled a diverse panel of experts to shine a light on the path to recovery from, from various angles. Um, as with the, the first panel, there will be time to engage with panelists at the end of the session. So please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our first panel, Ambassador Cinnamon Dornside, and she'll explore perspectives on an environmental reset. Ambassador Dornside is Senior Advisor of the International Development Program and Senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Um, at SAIS, Professor Dornside teaches courses on international financial institutions and social entrepreneurship. At the FPI, her research focuses on global governance and livable cities. She's also a former U.S. Ambassador and U.S. Executive Director at the Asian Development Bank, which makes her an ideal panelist for this joint event. She yeah. leads the social entrepreneurship and leadership activities at SITES, including serving as faculty director for the Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator Fund. She spent more than a decade serving the Asia Foundation in several senior positions at headquarters, heading the office in Washington, D.C., and also in the field office in Indonesia. So uh, let me turn the floor over now to uh, uh, Ambassador Dornsai for her initial comments. Uh, Cinnamon, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for that generous introduction and background. And in this panel that is going to explore the Great Reset, I'm going to be focusing on nature-based solutions for people, planet, and prosperity. Nearly 30 years after, after the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, we face a decade that scientists tell us is really our last chance to make good on the promises of Rio. And the two interlinked global agreements reached at that time, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Combating Climate Change leader after leader around the world confirms the challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss are connected, that the COVID-19 pandemic has its roots in tropical forest loss and the wildlife trade. We heard this earlier from my colleague, Dr. Jess Fanzo, that humanity and nature are seriously out of balance and that our entire sustainable development enterprise is under threat. Can we find opportunity in the face of the present global health and economic crisis to build back in ways that at once restore prosperity, uh, reduce the risks of future pandemics and address the climate and biodiversity crises? We must step up. So let's start with four propositions. First, nature is under assault. Over 40% of the world's land is now agricultural or urban with only 23% of the land and just 13% of the ocean still classified as intact ecosystems. Second, conserving and restoring nature is critical for achieving the sustainable development agenda. The UN SDGs 
include goals on climate change and the conservation of biodiversity and ecosystems, these quote unquote environmental SDGs also underpin economic and social SDGs, such as food security and the provision of clean air and water. Current trends in biodiversity and ecosystem degradation undermine progress towards achieving 80% of the SDGs related to poverty, hunger, health, water, cities, climate, oceans, and land, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. We cannot ignore these critical issues. Third, slowing the loss of primary forests and key coastal ecosystems are important, but our remaining primary forests and biodiversity rich and carbon dense coastal systems such as coral reefs and mangroves are most critical for slowing biodiversity loss and for climate change and mitigation and adaptation. These are also the ecosystems facing the fastest rates of degradation and loss. If we lose these battles, we lose the war. Fourth, COVID-19 has demonstrated the high cost of the growing imbalance between people and nature. The zoonotic origin of the pandemic has highlighted the risks of disrupting this delicate equilibrium between human and natural systems. The impacts on human health and the global economy have been devastating, as has been demonstrated by the remarks made by my distinguished co-panelists um, who spoke in the panel one. And these have strained public and financial systems, as has been outlined by our keynote speaker, and throwing social and economic inequalities into sharp relief. And the progressive destruction of nature, tropical forests in particular, appears to be a significant cause of zoonotic disease and outbreaks. So what do we do in the face of such daunting challenges? A big part of our collective approach, as advocated in scholarly work, including the F20 Foundation's Nexus Report, which will be included as a follow-up to this event um, for those that would like to read it in greater depth, is devising and adopting nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions can be defined as they are by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore ecosystems that at once address societal challenges, all of those SDGs, while providing for human well-being and helping achieve climate and biodiversity goals, which are all interconnected, as I've just um, indicated. With these four propositions in mind, I join others in a global call for action for effective, impactful nature-based solutions. So what are those? Uh, first, avoid relaxation of environmental regulation in the name of COVID-19 stimulus and recovery. Some governments are relaxing environmental protection and enforcement policies as part of their COVID-19 economic stimulus and recovery packages. This approach is unwise and short-sighted as it provides very limited, if any, emergency economic stimulus and undermines commitment on climate change, nature conservation, the protection of public health and nature-based tourism and recovery. Second, maintain the political space and rights for civil society and the press to serve as an effective transparency and monitoring function regarding recovery and stimulus policies. Some governments have used the pandemic as a pretext to suppress the rights of free expression and politi political action. While political systems differ across the world, responsible governments must avoid this tendency and should unite in discouraging such measures by others. Third, provide income support to reduce the risk of poverty-induced encroachment into nature. Governments should ensure that safety nets are in place, targeting the poorest and most vulnerable to food and nutrition insecurity. And again, my colleague Jess Fanzo outlined what the dramatic effects, horrible effects would be if this is not paid adequate attention. And this will also have the benefit of reducing the need for those populations to rely on forests and other natural ecosystems and wildlife for their food security and livelihoods. Fourth, repurpose subsidies and other public support towards activities that conserve nature and incentivize nature-based solutions to post-pandemic 
economic recovery and restructuring. For example, of the more than 700 billion paid in agricultural subsidies each year, only 15% of this goes towards building public goods. Fifth, invest in human capital. And this will ring true to all of us in the university community, especially young people, to develop the skills and entrepreneurial mindset required to seize opportunities related to a nature positive economy. The world young people faced a year ago was already changing at an unprecedented rate. The pandemic has radically accelerated the pace and direction of this change. This young generation will need a substantially new set of skills to confront and adapt to a post-COVID world already reeling from climate change and biodiversity loss. And last, I call for mobilizing public international development cooperation to support a just and sustainable economic recovery. Wealthier donor countries who are understandably currently preoccupied with their own battle against the coronavirus, they must be, and also its economic impacts, they must be, but they should not allow the present crisis to compromise the need for sustained international development assistance to poorer countries who are also grappling with this on top of other long-term challenges. This is not only the right thing to do, it is also in everyone's self-interest, including those in wealthier nations in our globally interdependent world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Cinema. Uh, it's taking me a while to find all the buttons. <laughs> But uh, uh, that was a, a, a great opening there, uh, particularly uh, the, the issues of, of nature-based solutions um, in, in thinking about how we're going to be moving forward with the, the kinds of investments that are going to be needed to uh, essentially uh, avoid what might be a, a, the, the next pandemic um, if we don't start making those investments now. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to you uh, later in the session with uh, questions, but I'd like to now move to uh, our second panelist, Dr. Martin Bloom, who will consider the workplace of the future. Uh, Dr. Bloom is the inaugural Robert S. Lawrence Professor and current director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Liberal uh, Future uh, in the De Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. A medical doctor as well as a PhD, he joined the center in 2017 after a 12 year stint as a senior nutrition advisor at the United Nations World Food Program and as global coordinator for the joint United Nations program on HIV AIDS. His appointment as professor at the school and director of CLF followed years of service to the Bloomberg School of Public Health as an adjunct associate professor. Uh, Dr. Bloom, the floor is yours. I'm afraid you're still muted. Okay, so it is um, really a very pleasure to be part of this panel. Uh, like uh, I enjoyed the, the first speakers uh, enormously, and uh, it's interesting. I, ju I just maybe would like to start because I don't have any slides, um, with you know, repeating a bit what has been said before. So I, I worked in and lived in uh, between 1985 and 2005 in Asia in Thailand and Bangladesh, Indonesia and Singapore. So it's a quite long, extensive uh, living in Asia. And it's very nice to be here on the panel uh, with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, so um, I was also regional director at that time and I dealt with also many other, uh, other countries in Asia. Uh, then I moved in 2005 to the World Food Program and I was responsible for health and nutrition and, and also almost like 13 years uh, WFP representative for UNAIDS. The last three years, uh, so I moved to Johns Hopkins and I'm actually more dealing with sustainable uh, food systems and, and, and the link between the health system. Um, and I, I like to talk a bit more about, okay, what are the mechanisms to think about based on the lessons learned so far from COVID-19? Um, and I, I thought I should start exactly what Ambassador Cinnamon already did, talking about SDGs. You know, most of, most of us were involved in the development of the SDGs. And as we all know, they were very much based 
on the technical working groups. Like for example, we dealt with food, with food systems, uh, hunger issues uh, in Rome. And, and many of the agencies, all the meetings we organized were actually based on the Rome-based agencies, of course, with many other inputs uh, and government inputs, of course, and NGO inputs and like, like uh, academics. But it was still very much based on one particular angle, uh, and it was experts in the field of food systems. And so it was the same when we talked about the health components or when we talked about the poverty. And uh, when, in fact, the SDGs were uh, established, in, uh, it was very clear that there was a need for another goal. And that's why goal 17 came in and talking about, you know, that we need to work together. Like, uh, so the uh, 17 focusing on collaboration. But to me, it was, it was really interesting because the, the only program I think uh, have shown successful work at global level is in fact the UN AIDS uh, joint program. And being part of the program is, was really, really interesting. We have so many lessons learned from that. Because we, you know, from the UN perspective, there were 11 UN agencies involved in, in fact, the joint program. And each of us had a different division of labor. Like, you know, we had to focus, for example, I had to focus on food security and humanitarian issues. Well, uh, WHO was focusing mainly on the disease itself. UNICEF on children, for example, UNDP on legislation issues, the World Bank on finance. But we were all working from our own expertise, but we had to come up with one particular framework and looking also not only at the positive consequences, but also looking at the unintended consequences. And being an academic for the past three years, it, it is to me really interesting that actually I could focus so much more on, I would say, observation than being part of what's happening at the global level. And what I've learned is that, uh, you know, not many of us have focused on unintended consequences. We always focus on what we like to accomplish, but not looking at the potential negative impacts of our choices. And, um, and just listening to, you know, like I felt this, you know, the last one half hour, a bit being at the UN AIDS meeting. You know, we heard uh, Jess, uh, a fantastic presentation about the implications on the food system. We heard uh, the, the, all the technical issues related with uh, the issue of, of, of uh, the fires itself by Dr. Nuzzo but also Dr. Savada looking at the economic impact, even not at the global level, but also at the specific country level, like know your epidemic. So that was, that was really interesting. Um, but, and, but what we are missing, of course, and what I've not heard is like, how do we put all those different angles together in a policy? So if, if I sitting back at in, in, in an academic chair and looking at what's going on in the world over the past year, particularly looking at Europe, uh, the US of course too, but Europe, I come from Europe, I come from Holland, uh, which I always thought they had great policies, but it was it is actually pretty chaos. Uh, you think about the responses, uh, there is political chaos, there's a lot of demonstrations, uh, there's a mix of, of, of information, uh, people uh, looking at mental health issues, you see children, uh, mental health is, is involved. The, the lockdown has unintended consequences. Uh, at the same time, if we don't do it, we have an incredible overburden of the healthcare system. Uh, vaccination programs are not working properly. It, it's very clear that uh, it's when you only keep it in the hands of a government, as well as, for example, uh, people with my background, health background, uh, then it will not work. You know, if, if the UN AIDS program was only with WHO, it would not have worked. It was essential that all different angles were taken into account. And I think, so I was really surprised that the UN actually a year ago, not maybe at the beginning, but very quickly didn't build in fact on the UN AIDS experience and said, the COVID-19 is such a huge problem. We need to have many different agencies in the fall in, in fact, the policies, looking at unintended consequences. And I think um, that is very, very difficult, of course, in practice, but if we don't do it, we get all these responses that, you know, we need vaccination. It's very clear. This, it's actually similar as what we saw in UNH. We, certainly we had a treatment, so we need to do testing and treatment. 
but testing was not very easy if you think about the healthcare system. And so what were the incentives? Food security played a role, for example. So I, I could see that uh, it, is, it is actually strange that FEO, the Rome-based agencies, were not part of the global community tackling the problem. They did a lot, but they did things on their own. So I, I think it is, it's extremely uh, uh, important that we think in the future that we work in a different way. Um, I also realized, of course, that uh, it's not for nothing that, that if you look at human capacity and, and investment in young children, one of the bases is that, that we need an economic development and that should be the main driver. But currently, most of the economic choices we are making, as what Ambassador Cinnamon already mentioned, we haven't looked at the unintended consequences. The agriculture sector expanding and looking at hunger doesn't mean that we don't have to look at the same time at what, we, what the consequences are of expanding our agriculture sector. So I, I, I do feel that it's uh, extremely critical for us to have a model which doesn't look only at 17 as, oh yeah, you have to collaborate. We need to be very practical and say, what are the mechanisms to work together and looking at these unintended consequences? Because if we don't, exactly what I think Dr. Nusso already said, we are lucky to a certain extent with COVID-19 that it only actually affects people with my, in my age, you know, above 65. And so what would have happened if in fact it would have been more aggressive and actually don't only uh, kill people uh, at my age? And we don't know, we have no reason. I was involved in Ebola, also of course, zoonosis. We don't know when in fact the next pandemic will come. People think, okay, that will be take for another decade or so. But looking exactly what the indications are, what Ambassador Sinderman already mentioned, we can, think, we can see that it's around the corner. So in conclusion, I do feel that the driver of everything in the world is most probably the economy. But if we don't look into very critical from all different angles, what the consequences are of those policies, then I think we will make the same mistakes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Martin, for your, your thoughts on, on the complexity of, of, of trying to address so many policy goals simultaneously, uh, as well as your, your thinking on you know, what really is the, is the path to, to trying to do that effectively. Uh, and we'll be back to you again for, for, for questions at the end of the, the session. Um, our next panelist is, is Dr. Mia Mickett, Mikic, and she will consider the important roles for trade, investment, and regional development. Uh, Dr. Mikic is a, C a trade economist with a keen interest in sustainable development. Uh, she served the, uh, as director of the Trade, Investment, and Innovation Division in the United Nations SCAP. She is currently an advisor for the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, ARTNET. Uh, an open network of research and academic institutions and think tanks in the Asia Pacific region. Prior to her UN tenure, she was head of the Department of Economic Theory, Professor of International Economics, and Director of Economic and Business International Program at the University of Zagreb, and Senior Lecturer at the University of Auckland. She is the author of many books, reports, and papers, and has edited or coded several volumes on international economics, regional integration and development. Um, she oversaw the preparation of the Asia Pacific Trade and Investment Report, a flagship publication uh, in the area of trade and investment. And this makes her uh, particularly well suited to address this issue today. Uh, with that, uh, Mia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. And uh, I also want to, uh, first of all, yes, thank uh, um, the organizers uh, for the invitation, but also the, the panelists that spoke uh, before me because they have actually laid the, the ground very well and, uh, you know, mentioned all the relevant components in particular uh, uh, in particular uh, the uh, the previous uh, speaker who spoke uh, about SDGs and of course SDG 17 that is on global partnership 
so uh, my task is really to take it a little bit further and to talk about cooperation in the area of uh, trade and investment and the role um, in uh, you know finding the the way out of of this pandemic but also to perhaps set the stage for um, uh, having uh, being better prepared for future uh, future likely uh, crisis that that will come and um, uh, i uh, i would i would like to to start with 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 a reference to a blog that uh, that that we penned uh, about a year ago actually on the 14th of february which we titled when 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 china sneezes uh, asia catches uh, catches the cold and in in um, you know in uh, in in that particular uh, blog we uh, and to quote we we said that gvcs the global value chains have made its participants truly codependent they rise together and also fall together and this requires that in the face of the common external shocks like the pandemic uh, the response must be the cooperation and uh, i start with this because uh, uh, obviously there are various ways in countries which can cooperate in area of trade and investment and uh, i would like uh, in this limited time to focus on two uh, particular um, uh, parts or the particular uh, channels. One is multilateral or global uh, cooperation uh, through, of course, the institutions of the World Trade uh, Organization. And another one is at the regional level. And I'm very um, pleased that uh, both the institutions that, uh, that I until recently worked for, the United Nations and the Asian Development Bank uh, spare, uh, you know, no resources to actually promote and support the member states that, uh, that uh, greatly overlap in enabling them uh, uh, to, to deepen the cooperation at the, at the regional front. But let me start with the, with the global one and then uh, I think there is no uh, secret that that currently we are a little bit uh, in a, in a, a sort of a, 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 a good uh, good feel uh, environment because uh, as we know the world uh, the, the world uh, trade organization has uh, uh, finally gotten the the formal head uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, uh, who is the first woman uh, and African head of the World Trade Organization that uh, has been uh, in existence since uh, 1995. And uh, it, it is a good feel moment because, uh, you know, there is this excitement and, of course, uh, the and the honeymoon period, which I don't think will uh, will probably last too long, but the the idea of uh, the, the the global uh, trade uh, trade uh, trade regime um, uh, and its role in the in the in the um, uh, resolution of of crisis um, uh, has been you know uh, on 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 the table for for a long period of time, but nothing much concrete was done until really we got uh, into into this uh, this situation and uh, i mean the new director general of course is talking about doing things differently and doing things uh, in a, in, a, in a way to really seek the uh, the compromise and the agreement but when we look at the areas that uh, that are on the table for the for the countries to really explore uh, then uh, and i'll just list uh, some of them um, for example the 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 area of industrial subsidies, the area of uh, liberalization of uh, services, and the issue of domestic uh, domestic support or domestic regulation in 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 that area, uh, the digital things, uh, e-commerce, etc., trade facilitation, transparency, uh, and of course uh, the issues related to the uh, global standards that uh, that have uh, in you know particularly became of essence in uh, in the context context of, uh, of this pandemic and of course uh, likewise the intellectual property protection uh, that we are now um, uh, really uh, 
discussing uh, day in and day out in the, in the context of the vaccine distribution and, and, and production. And the area that has been um, area of concern uh, over, over a certain period of time in, in the context of dispute settlement. So these are not new areas and we have actually had them on the, on the table uh, for, for rather, you know, from the very beginning. So the, what, what, what will uh, actually take the membership to try to find uh, some agreements on, on these areas. And uh, I think uh, probably the, the, the good guidance for the members is to start to look at what are the three common elements uh, that, uh, that have made all of these areas very important to, to, to work on commonly. Uh, and these three elements are interdependency of the, of, of the, of the members through the, uh, through the global uh, value chains and the globalization uh, in, in terms of their production trade and you know, economic and, and social actually future. Uh, and then there is this element of uh, a deep concern with increasing and deepening uh, inequalities. And as was said just previously, uh, the issues with the looming uh, climate, climate crisis. So if we take these elements and put them together uh, and look how we can then seek the solutions then, uh, then we have to really understand uh, that the, uh, that the interdependence um, has uh, has augmented the cost of any of the global shocks. And if we do not actually provide uh, a, a rules and the stable environment to reduce the uh, uncertainty that has been increasing over the last, uh, you know, four or five years, um, uh, in, uh, we, we will not be able to, uh, to um, respond to the shocks whether they are health, whether they are demand, whether they are supply shocks, uh, in a way that uh, that is necessary to actually uh, deliver uh, the prosperity and the, the stable growth uh, to to the people, which is the main task, of course, of every of every government. So, uh, I think um, the the members probably will have to to orient themselves uh, in in that context and. The, uh, and the, the big test for that will be the coming uh, ministerial conference uh, number 12 that is uh, again being postponed, uh, postponed from, from June to the end of this year. Uh, but hopefully with the, the set agenda, uh, we'll be able to actually produce some of the, uh, some of the results and uh, uh, start the discussion on very, practical uh, solutions that can be achieved, uh, one of which could be, for example, a, a elimination of tariffs on uh, all the hygienic uh, goods and goods that are related to the, uh, to the uh, uh, you know, fight against uh, uh, health, uh, health pandemics like this. Uh, what we find currently uh, among the WTO membership is that many of them have uh, tariffs on uh, products like soaps or, or other uh, uh, hygienic products that are well over 10% or sometimes even uh, 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 higher than 20%. And there is no really no reason uh, to have these in place. So this would, uh, um, of course, improve the affordability and access uh, to such products uh, where they are most needed and, uh, and uh, it should not be a problem to actually uh, come on board of, of uh, on on these. So uh, the the one of the reasons why we have not seen um, much progress uh, in um, in um, reaching these concrete results through the multilateral negotiations uh, in some commentators' words, is uh, actually the, 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 the fault of the success of the WTO. And, and, they, <laughs> and, and they say, because it was so successful, uh, it ac accumulated too many members. And now because of the way of the decision-making, which is based on consensus and, uh, and, and a specific uh, way of 
nothing being able to to be agreed until everything is agreed uh, the agenda that has uh, actually deepened and uh, moved on from the uh, from the only border areas to to some other areas uh, it's not possible to make uh, to make uh, these um, these uh, agreements um, uh, which factually is true but uh, when you then uh, and let me now move to the other area of cooperation which is at the at the subset of the WTO members and uh, so when we look at the willingness to negotiate and to reach the successful uh, conclusion of negotiations at the regional front in the in the area of regional trade agreements then we see governments uh, uh, really being able and being very productive in in that area in asia for example we have uh, in in force uh, over 180 regional trade agreements which constitutes actually more than 50 percent of the global number of the enforced uh, regional trade agreements and many of them uh, uh, actually deal with the areas that are not uh, standard narrow uh, border trade liberalization areas but are comprehensive uh, uh, agreements and deal with uh, all sorts of other issues related to uh, to cooperation across and behind the borders competition intellectual property rights government procurement and others so uh, it is not true that the governments are not able to um, to reach the agreement. It 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 actually uh, talks or or points to the to to the level of with whom they want to reach that agreement. And obviously, uh, the modus operandi through the global system when they would uh, be asked to to expand the. Um, the, the certain benefits and, and, and preferences that they are willing to agree with few to do all of the members, uh, maybe the maybe uh, one of the limitations or one of the barriers of why we, we have uh, no fast progress. And so the in moving forward with the with the with the global, um, there are very strong recommendations that uh, that the process is now turn to the uh, to to the um, subset groups to the like-minded groups uh, in a parallel fashion so that the some of the progress can be uh, some momentum can be gained and then to see how these can be multilateralized there are of course some objections uh, to these from some of the larger um, uh developing countries but uh it is still on the table and hopefully uh if we can learn from the regional trade agreements and success uh, from them then the lessons can be taken uh into into that that front uh, one lesson that we learned from the from the uh, pandemic is um, and i'm looking at the time so i will be finishing soon i know my time is 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 close uh, to, to them is that when the pandemic hit um and and we know we were we were actually uh, participating in uh, in the in the uh, uh you know the 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 consequences of all the disruptions in the in the markets with particular essential goods etc the governments reacted in a, in a sort of a panic self preservation mode and uh started imposing all sorts of uh distort trade distorting uh, measures uh leading to of course um, uh, even deeper deeper problems and distortions but the reason for that was really the lack of confidence in the trade rules that they were looking at and uh and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, 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 to inform that, uh, that uh, UN and the agencies, uh, global agencies, including WTO and, and, and UNCTAD, we have uh, put in place the, the initiative to actually um, uh, look into this lack of uh, clear uh, guidance and rules with respect to management of crisis through the trade instruments and trade and trade rules and are putting in place now uh, not only the inventory of possible solutions but also the the training and information information resources that would be able to help countries to actually then uh, look into the possible solutions and build them in in front in you know uh, 
preemptive mode by putting them as part of the trade agreements so that the, in case of the crisis, uh, emergency or shock, they can actually refer back to uh, that particular uh, set of provisions and uh, with confidence and mutual trust. Uh, follow the the instruments and the solutions that that are proposed through that, whether they are in a stock uh, piling or mutual uh, uh, recognition of policies uh, or other um, uh, other measures. Um, uh, it it would help in uh, the future situation that that we will certainly come to, uh, as it was made clear from the previous presentations. Uh, these provisions will also help countries by providing better definitions of what the emergency is, what are the essential products and services, uh, how long does temporary means, uh, and uh, because in the in the in in the current pandemic, none of these was clear, and so the there was a variety of the of the uh, uh, reactions of the government policies that then caused uh, quite uh, quite quite many disruptions in the in the market uh, and of course what also is important and i will close with that is to really enable uh, all the countries to cooperate more deeply and more confidently in the area of digital economy as we saw uh, from the from the last year's reactions uh, those countries that were able to actually uh, use uh, digital uh, uh, digitization of processes in trade uh, facilitation and in uh, in moving the even the, the domestic areas of economic activities to the digital sphere were impacted less and were able to actually get into a more normal um, uh, uh, performance in, in terms of trade uh, than the others. And so uh, much deeper cooperation in the digital area uh, is, is necessary. So hopefully both global and regional rules like the uh, just uh, the agreement on paperless trade that was just put in place uh, a few weeks back uh, would enable countries to actually deepen that, that cooperation and to set new rules in a context uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know, minimizing the cost of a future of future pandemics. So let me uh, uh, just stop here, uh, and um, and uh, I would be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mia. Uh, and especially you you gave us a very nice transition to our our, our next speaker with the, your last comments. Uh, but I appreciate uh, your uh, especially your thoughts on the ways that the, the pandemic, in fact, can be used uh, to as, a, as an opportunity to highlight uh, areas or priority areas for uh, trade liberalization in, in the post-pandemic era. Um, so with that, let me turn to our, our final panelist, which is my colleague, Mr. Thomas uh, Abel, and he'll give his thoughts on digitalization and its implications. Uh, Mr. Abel is the chief of ADB's Digital Technology for Development Unit. His unit promotes the effective use of digital technologies across ADB programs to improve development impact. Uh, his team works with ADB members in supporting the transition to the digital economy and provides assistance across many areas, including e-government, tech startup ecosystems, technology policy, and industrial partnerships. Thomas has over 30 years of professional experience in digital technology, including technology policy and strategy, software development, and systems architecture. Uh, during his more than 10 years uh, uh, of experience in international development, he has worked extensively across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, working with governments, development organizations, NGOs, and corporations. He uh, has authored many publications on technology innovation in development, focused mainly on education, financial inclusion, and agriculture. Uh, with that, uh, Thomas, let me turn the floor over to you for your comments. Thanks, Joe, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me. And my comments, I'm going to focus on four major points around uh, digitization. First is the uh, acceleration of the digital economy caused by the pandemic. And then second is the uh, addressing the challenge of bridging the digital divide, as many folks have, have mentioned, and uh, our president, Asakawa, has uh, always made a priority um, since the beginning of the pandemic within, within ADB. 
Uh, the third one is the challenges that are actually created by digitization that we need to address. And then fourth, I'll just talk a little about kind of the long-term opportunity that we don't want to lose sight of. So in terms of the acceleration, everybody has seen this, you know, the, the digital economy is coming and we've been preparing for it in ADB and Asia has been on the forefront of that. Um, but the pandemic has accelerated from many estimates, uh, like uh, tech companies looking at their market forecasts or product adoption. Uh, the, the, the pandemic has accelerated this by about two years um, in terms of adoption of online health, online shopping, um, entertainment, online work. And this is uh, one of the major uh, implications that uh, we need to then take advantage of. And, um, and I would say, you know, it's worked fairly well, you know, as, as folks have mentioned, you know, that um, uh, many things have, have shifted to online and have, have done that quite uh, effectively. Some things haven't worked well, and we've seen uh, with the ADB staff, for example, uh, online education is particularly difficult for families with children, and that sort of highlights the... Um, the dual role of education as also a child care for young children. And that's an area where digitization has really um, faced uh, enormous challenges and people are really looking forward to going back to the uh, old normal in that case. Um, but if you look at uh, the broader trends in education, especially for um, people already in the workforce, the move to online it has accelerated and will continue to. Um, I think the biggest impact is the fact that people have been able to work remotely so effectively and uh, all the forecasts are that, you know, a good number of those people will go back to the office when they're able to, but uh, the numbers actually will be quite large, uh, up to 20% of people who um, are working remotely will remain working remotely and a large fraction of remote workers will actually do that part-time. So that really opens up tremendous opportunities, you know, for um, eliminating, um, you know, time spent commuting and uh, cost of, of, uh, of um, travel and uh, a shift in the uh, use of office space and even a shift to pe where people are living and working because if people can work remotely, then it opens up opportunities for people to relocate to more attractive destinations. These are all uh, really powerful trends that the pandemic has uh, opened up and um, will continue um, as, you know, as many researchers are, are looking at. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the pandemic has also highlighted uh, the second point, which is the digital divide that in Asia, we know, and across the world, uh, approximately 50% of uh, the population is connected to the internet. So 50% of people unconnected are unable to um, take advantage of all the uh, you know things available um, that have been highlighted during the pandemic, and this is really a major problem. Uh, ADB has invested in um, connectivity solutions uh, for many years, from you know developing submarine cables to supporting new telco operators to supporting our member governments uh, developing broadband policies. We've been invested in. Uh, broadband satellite uh, solution a couple of years ago that is serving Asia and the Pacific today. Um, so there, there's a lot of investments that we've been making, but, but yet reaching the remaining 50% is going to take a, a lot of um, uh, acceleration and change. And, and one way to look at it is that, um, you know, most of the problem of reaching the remaining 50% is actually not expanding the coverage. You know, I think it's about only about 8% of the world is outside of a coverage area. It's the main problem of reaching the remaining 50% is affordability and uh, affordability of services and affordability of devices. These are big challenges. And if you look at where telcos are investing these days, you know, and telcos invest about 200 billion per year in infrastructure, um, but about 75% of that looking forward will be um, to um, uh, build out 5G networks. Those won't necessarily bring lower cost uh, service or lower cost devices. So uh, there, there really does need to be a, a relook at this of what we can do to reach the remaining uh, 50%. Um, 
which we especially need to get in place, you know, if another pandemic comes, so we don't have so many people who are really left out. There are many new approaches that uh, ADB is looking at and the private sector and, um, you know, many opportunities. We're, we're doing some research and developing some publications in that area. Everybody's probably heard of uh, Starlink, which is a, a new service being offered by um, SpaceX. That will actually be, um, is actually launching now and will bring a lot of, uh, uh, service available to uh, wider areas. And there are also new ways of rolling out uh, service to low income uh, people besides, um, you know, just focusing on the, uh, the ones that currently can afford service. So the bridging the digital divide continues to be a, a big challenge. The, the second, the third, the third point that I want to bring up is addressing uh, issues where digitalization is actually causing problems um, and uh, we all know about what most of these are you know the income inequality because uh, digitization creates winners and losers uh, the risk of privacy and cybersecurity, um, problems with uh, cross-regional data flows and and cross-regional uh, digital markets um, the problems of regulating global tech giants and making sure that they actually um, you know, can, can uh, serve uh, the public good effectively across so many different, uh, different countries, uh, even addressing the issues with the, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, digital um, uh, basically challenges between uh, China and the U.S. on uh, you know, trade of digital goods. Um, and then also taxation as uh, the digital economy is, uh, makes it harder for uh, countries to raise revenue um, as uh, many of these services can uh, move profits around uh, easily and, and um, I think there's been some good progress in that area. So uh, these challenges need to be addressed by um, prudent regulation and policy and uh, cross-regional collaboration. I think especially in Asia where all the tech giants are focused on their new markets uh, is where a lot of this work needs to be done. I think the pandemic has highlighted how that, uh, you know, really uh, needs to be done more urgently because the, the digital economy now is, is upon us. Um, and then uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the long-term opportunity of the digital economy. I think people, you know, uh, can get stuck in the, uh, you know, the issues and, and the challenges, uh, you know, especially with only 50% of the world connected today. But if you look at the long term, it really is um, a case for uh, still a lot of optimism, uh, especially if you look at the next challenge you know, after the pandemic is over as uh, climate change where you know, we're still addressing that. And um, di the digital economy opens the door to being able to uh, move uh, activities and work that are currently in the physical world into more of a virtual world as we've seen people working from home for example and then not needing to travel back and forth to the office every day um, people uh, you know doing entertainment online instead of having to travel to say a, a different location or people moving from a factory job to a, a digital job um, this will allow economic growth to continue um, and effectively decouple from you know from uh, carbon emissions more effectively and um, I think this challenge we all have to look at and make sure we can actually harness it because the, the pandemic has, by accelerating the digital economy, has kind of shown us that this uh, decoupling can happen and we need to take, make the most advantage of it. So I guess that's my uh, quick summary and I'll hand it back to you, Joe, and uh, thanks again. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, and. Uh, you covered quite a lot of ground there in, in, in a short period. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that they can uh, add their questions to the, the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm going to go sort of backward through the, 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 the panel and asking the questions. Uh, but if, if all of the panelists could uh, turn on their, their cameras so that we can uh, see everybody uh, in the group. Um, but uh, Thomas, uh, you had, had mentioned uh, that the issue is, is less about um, access at this point and more about affordability. Um, and, and that becomes a bit, a bit trickier uh, when uh, it, it's not about large infrastructure investments. Um, but how can uh, governments 
um, you know, what are some of the, 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 the areas that they can actually take active role in, in helping to ensure affordability? Uh, and in, in the multilaterals like ADB, you know, what, what is there that we can do to also uh, address this affordability issue without introducing a lot of inefficiencies? Uh, Thomas? Sure. Great. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, this is a really difficult problem because the telcos really want to expand their service and with the customers that are profitable. And to, to serve um, very low income people, they really need very low price products. And uh, it's very difficult to do. I would say there are some examples, though. One is having good policy for broadband access so that, you know, governments can provide certain types of subsidies uh, certain types of incentives. These actually work if, if they're done right. There are also new models, and we're actually doing some work with ITU on this. The example of Reliance Geo in India is a stark example because they built an entire network from scratch that's based on data only. It does not support all the old standards of 2G and 3G. It's 4G only, and it's built on data only, and they offered that service for free for six months and um, they invested about 22 billion building out the service, including 7 billion for the wireless spectrum. And now the company is worth 65 billion as market cap, partly because they're covering 400 million people and they're monetizing not just the data charges, but they're building the whole infrastructure of e-commerce and entertainment and apps. And they're trying to monetize the customers across, across a much wider range than just their monthly uh, you know, service charge. That kind of example can work in other countries too. And ADB is investing you know, in telco uh, uh, competition and you know, uh, policies to uh, make a more efficient use of spectrum, things like that that could encourage the same type of model in other countries. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, uh, Mia, I've got a, a question. Uh, to you that's come to us from in the Q&A box here. Uh, and it, it was looking at, you know, what kind of changes do you expect in global supply chains, and particularly in, in major goods suppliers in, in Asia? So how can countries uh, cope with this, this new change? Uh, Amiya? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Well, of course, the issue of global value chains uh, has become very politicized and, you know, from the efficiency and geoeconomic uh, issue, it has become more geopolitical issue. But uh, the, the, the solutions, uh, I think, uh, are to be found in, again, in empirical evidence. And so what we have seen, actually, through the, uh, through the last year is that uh, the, the the value chains have uh, have very quickly started to operate, and in in many cases for many countries, uh, they were instrumental in providing goods uh, that that were needed to address the the, the health crisis. So the pr the problem is not in uh, global value chains. The problem was really in the lack of policies that um, that could have used uh, to control the pandemic in a, in a, from the health perspective, rather than from uh, uh, restricting people's mobility, uh, and uh, that mobility then uh, went into the supply and and uh, uh, demand shocks. So anyway, uh, because of all these complexities, uh, we will definitely see uh, reorganization of uh, value chains, uh, particularly uh, in some sectors. Uh, definitely because of the because of uh, now understanding that we need to treat certain products as essential and. Uh, treated uh, differently, we will have a shortening of the supply chains and domestication in some of these that relates to, you know, the, the, the medical equipment or the, the components for the production of uh, pharma, etc. But in some other, and maybe even in some, in, in some sense, in some of the um, uh, ITC uh, sectors, etc. But for some others, uh, I don't think we will see such, um, such radical changes. Uh, they will be driven by both consumer, uh, consumer um, 
uh, situation, whether the consumers have changed preferences and behavior and where the consumers are, uh, where is the potential uh, market for the producers. So what we are looking at is really some shortening, uh, some uh, reorganization in terms of diversifying so that, uh, that risks are actually assessed better and managed better, uh, which, which uh, hasn't been done uh, a pre-COVID situation uh, in, in, to that extent. Uh, and that may have some developmental consequences. Uh, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, such, such reorganization may actually prevent some of the developing countries that were counting on being part of the global value chains uh, to be bypassed. Um, uh, by, by those. So that's a different uh, set of uh, discussion uh, issues. But, uh, but th this is what we expect to, to see in Asia. So Asia will remain uh, part of the, of the uh, or one of the main hubs uh, for the production in value chains, but the, the, the nature and the, the length and the, the, the scope complexity of these chains will be changing depending on the sector, depending on which players are involved and depending on really uh, how far the governments will undertake to, to try to interfere um, and influence the companies in when they make decisions on where to produce and, and, and what and how. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mia. Uh, Martin, in your comments, you, you talked about the, the, the complexity uh, uh, of the, the multiple goals that are the SDGs, uh, but also how they're, they're very much interrelated uh, and uh, that, that you know, moves in, in one area uh, uh, with, without um, some thoughts about the, the interactions between the, the different goals uh, um, can lead to these, these suboptimal outcomes. Um, but when it comes to, to you know, budgeting and policy priority setting, uh, oftentimes that, that complexity is, is either difficult to build in or, or governments lack the, the, the capacity or, or their own systems are very much siloed. Uh, what's some of the advice that, that you would give um, in, in the post pandemic world using this uh, as a, uh, the, this pandemic as a jumping off point as an example of, of, of how these complex problems can, can come and lead to these, these massive disasters. How would you then sort of uh, advise governments moving forward to to think differently about setting policy priorities and budgeting priorities. Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe, for, for this question. Like, to be, I would like to start a bit to say, you know, like, um, I didn't have a chance. Like, like I'm not very optimistic, to be honest, and and um, and that's why I was talking about UNH because that's actually a positive example. But just listening to, you know the ambassador, she was very clear that if you look at climate, there's nothing. Jess Fonso also said very clearly, there's no money for nutrition. There's no money for, in fact, climate change. There's money for COVID because we were all affected by COVID-19. And if you go, that's why I, I gave the example of UNAIDS, because if you, if you, if you, if you know, there was no money for, for UNAIDS at all. It didn't even exist. It only started when there was a resolution by the UN of the Security Council. It was, not, it was not in health, it was not in, it was because of the Security Council, they had a resolution and that was the beginning of the funding of UNAIDS. Similar in a way as what happened with COVID-19 to a certain extent, no? Because we, we know it's like, the moment we had a better treatment, which we have, because you, you can live in principle, you know, you have same life expectancy with, with the current treatment although it doesn't cure, but it treats you well. Um, the interest of many donors have diminished. There's still money, but it has diminished dramatically. And so the problem of HIV AIDS is now a problem of poverty. Like it's mainly the poor, the, the low income countries and within countries, the poorest of the poor, even in the US, it's very clear. It's the ones who are most affected by it. So it means, in fact, that it will increase, again, what we're talking about, the, the inequality of our world, and if you, if you look at country level, at our societies. This is why I was, to be honest, shocked that this COVID-19 is only controlled by WHO. Not that WHO is not a good agency. There's nothing to do with it. 
but they cannot, they can only look through, from a health perspective. They cannot look at, even, even within WHO, you have to look at from a mental health perspective, from an, in, you know, you know, from all different elements. And we haven't done it. Then. And this is why there's incredible confusion. It's interesting, HIV AIDS was confusing, of course, but we had relatively quickly some potential treatment and that's why it was a little bit more controlled. But in this case, you look at Europe, you look at the US, it's, it is absolutely, people are all over the place, no? We are, and this is for nothing that we still are struggling enormously with information, with, you know, what to do. Yes, there are positive, you know, implications, but more for a person like me, I was not affected by it. Well, I was affected. My mother passed away. I couldn't go to Holland. My, my daughter, I haven't seen my kids and my grandchildren for one half year. Uh, you know, like there are definitely implications, but not what I've seen around me for people in East and West Baltimore who have no access to food security, who have, you know, no health care. The government is providing something, but not for the other side. Even the treatment for HIV AIDS has diminished because people have no access anymore to, to health care systems. So what we need to understand is that we, if we want to tackle this, we have to work together, which is not very easy at all. Don't, don't misunderstand. UN AIDS was complex, was difficult, but we did it with all the issues. And so I feel when, when I hear an economist talking about, you know, okay, you know, not going, well, Asia has a lot of potential because it's a modern society, you know, and, and in principle, they can still, governments can still make decisions and, and, and to a certain extent, people will listen. But in Europe, it's not anymore the case like that. It's, you know, like, so you have to deal with many, many other issues in the future. So I feel we need in the university, that's why I'm talking about this, in the university, we need to teach students to deal with complexity. We need to teach, in fact, policymakers to deal with complexity, which is not easy because we don't have the solutions. We don't even have the models. We don't even have the statistical, you know, tools to help us out. It's complex. But if we don't do it, if we don't start to embrace complexity, I'm extremely worried because, because the, the, the future will be more and more complex. And you know what the ambassador was saying, if you look at climate, if you, if you go back and say, okay, let's, let's uh, you know, I'm a, a person who deals with nutrition. Let's solve the problem of nutrition, which is in principle more animal source food for young kids. So we produce more food, but it automatically can actually destroy the habitat of normal people. And so we can actually increase again the risk of spillover and zoonosis. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 need to, we, we need to rethink. And I think COVID-19 gave us a chance to rethink the models we are working with. I think it's possible, but so far I haven't seen any government yet to embrace that complexity. That, that's, that's why I'm worried. And that's why I'm a bit depressed. But. Uh, you know, I'm an optimist, but so eventually, hopefully, but it's true that, you know, there are positive messages too, and like, you don't, don't misunderstand me, but overall, I am worried. I, I thank you, Martin. I, I, I think, uh, you know, taking the, the point of building this uh, into essentially, especially, especially public policy schools, we yeah. are getting kind of young civil servants with, you know, a, a, an up and coming career path. Um, to, to, to think about these issues becomes, you know, uh, part and parcel of the, of the solution. Although you know, um, we're now starting to get uh, a lot of these pressures are, are no longer uh, things that we're thinking about it in, a, in a time horizon that, that is, is difficult to comprehend, but the, the, the changes are upon it. So and this particularly gets back to um, the, the, uh, what Ambassador Dornsack was saying in terms of the nature-based solutions. And so I want to kind of uh, come back to this with, with more of the, the critical eye as well of, we've, we've heard that, you know, Dr. Fonz was saying that, that um, uh, there's underfunding in these issues. Um, and this is, in some ways, it's like COVID-19 because it affects us all, but it's not like COVID-19 because it doesn't have that same immediate impact that, that you're sensing that I may become sick. I may die, somebody I know might become sick, somebody I know might die tomorrow. It's more uh, um, nebulous from a, a point of view because it, it is a, a bit longer term. And yet we are seeing these extreme weather events that, that, that there do seem to be some, some uh, 
a sense that this may be linked to, to, to uh, climate change. Um, although I guess the research there is still uh, something in order to even make that connection. Um, but at the same time, you have uh, uh, the, the, the climate deniers um, that are they're still quite vocal uh, uh, and, and sort of undermine the, the agenda. Um, so with all of this, this difficulty, um, mm. how, how do you um, get policymakers to you know, sort of reprogram their priorities, uh, especially at a time where many of them are gonna be, uh, budgets are gonna be quite stretched um, to, to build in these, these climate friendly policies. Um, and I say this also with a, uh, you know, a, a, um, a, 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 a corporate um, uh, view as well, because uh, ADB in, a, in our strategy 2030s, we have very uh, specific uh, targets for climate financing. Um, and of course, the, the strategy came in and then COVID came in. And now, uh, um, during the time of, of responding to the pandemic, it was very tricky to, to, to bring in these elements. We're now asking these very important questions as well of, how does ADB you know, reprogram itself to make sure that we're able to, to meet our, our, our climate targets at a time where everyone is going to be very stretched? So uh, let, let me close out with this, this very difficult question uh, to, to you, Cinnamon, on, on sort of thinking about uh, um, policy priorities and budgeting for uh, uh, nature-based solutions at, at a time then when it's going to be you know, difficult getting people to focus on that. Okay, Joe, I will do my best because, you know, it's just, uh, I, I think I'm going to respond by answering a question that you asked one of the other panelists by saying, what can the ADB do? And you've just kind of teed me up for that by talking about the, the dilemma that is faced by um, the management team at the ADB and, and indeed by its shareholders about meeting the commitments that you've all agreed to in fighting global climate change and particular in the Asia Pacific region, although it's clearly a global phenomenon. I would go back to those recommendations because these are concrete steps that ADB can take as one of the leading development banks. So, you know, the safety nets, I really focus on that, especially targeting the poorest and the most vulnerable to keep them from going into those critical ecosystems because they don't have enough to eat. They don't have livelihoods. So I would say those social safety nets targeting the poorest and most vulnerable, that's first. Second, I think we've talked a lot about being in the university, and I talked about the challenges that the younger generation is going to face going ahead. And uh, Martin, you made a really good point, I think, about the need to teach new skills of dealing with complexity. You know, one of the things that we drive home in the International Development Program that I've had the pleasure of being affiliated with these 15 years is that development is not easy. It's very complex. And so to keep driving that home in curriculum going forward, I think that's what sites and universities can do. But back to ADB can invest in human capital and in its own education programs to take a look at the kinds of approaches to innovation and teaching students how to deal with complexity is very important. I'd also repurpose subsidies. Remember I was talking about the um, agricultural subsidies and that very few, uh, less than 15% goes to global public goods to really take a look at subsidies. I've been really impressed with the IMF's work um, in taking a look, for example, at global fuel subsidies and really making that a hallmark of their policy advice to member governments. It's of course non-binding, uh, but I would say having the bully pulpit and having just a great respect and authority to really make a very compelling case to your shareholders about a, how complex this is, B, how important it is, and do not ignore in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic and all of the health and economic restructuring that has to take place uh, and responses that are very high priority, understandably. Use your, your megaphone 
uh, and your persuasive argu arguments with your shareholders about those kinds of policies. So that's my best try. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think that's a, a, a great way to wrap up this session. And I would like to, to thank all of the, the panelists for your, your insight. Um, it's a, it's a, a difficult road that we're going to, to be traveling uh, post pandemic and essentially in, in many ways we're, we're, we're starting out with our, our, our legs tied together because of all of the efforts that had to go into to survive the, the, the pandemic. Um, and this is from the viewpoint of, of still um, uh, being within the tunnel, as they were saying in, in session one. Uh, so but thank you all for, for this interesting discussion. And I, I look forward to, ha to having more of these in, in the future as the, the, the situation evolves. Um, with that, let me turn the, the floor back over to Professor Calder for, uh, to close up today's event. Uh, Professor Calder, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I must say, I certainly found this to be a, a pro provocative and thoughtful discussion as well. I was quite struck by uh, what my colleague Professor Bloom was saying about a more and more complex world that we're facing and the needs to find some paradigms for, for analyzing it. Um, of course, as we start with that, I don't think any of us can really forget the tragedy of this particular moment, the most sweeping pandemic in close to a century, perhaps, well, in just over a century, over 115 million cases, over two and a half million lives lost, 5% productivity decline worldwide, the food crises that uh, Professor Bloom and Professor Fonzo mentioned, new cases of poverty, uh, partly because of the changes in agriculture, the spread of disease, and, uh, the, and of course, all of the dislocations. I, uh, I must say, I've learned a tremendous amount I, you can't, we came into that. We're intensely interested, like I think a lot of people here, not, not in the public health school, of course, not specialists, but deeply interested in this. And that the vaccines are crucial is, is certainly a commonplace. But some of what was said about how they're produced, the new ecosystems that have emerged, and how uh, South South India and the surrounding countries, for example, uh, Indonesia and uh, it, the partnerships that it has, each of the major Asian countries he pointed out is, has a particular set of partnerships and there's quite a bit of production uh, within the region. The changes in agriculture uh, and their implications that several people took to, but at least for me, so much of this in the end that was new, I think has related to digitalization, its impact on the acceleration of the digital economy by a couple of years, as Mr. Abel pointed out, the digital divide, 50% of the world still not connected. What do we do about that? Um, the the ways that that is going to change our workplace, our, uh, the way our cities are configured. We didn't get into all of those issues, but I think we prefigured them and uh, we'll think about them more. Uh, uh, Ambassador Dornsife and others, of course, on the environment and both the, the silver lining of the digitalization and this kind of a tragedy forcing us toward new kinds of telecommuting and so on that might have positive environmental implications. But um, certainly the urgency of the environment, going back to nature perhaps, is, but in a different sort of way, one that's also sensitive to how um, the way that we've treated nature has also helped to stimulate some of the problems that we have with pandemics. So what I take away from this is that really through this pandemic, um, there's a new world that's being born now. It's a world that's more digital. Um, in the next year, we're going to see a rapid economic uptick in 
many countries um, and it will look like for many of course a more prosperous world but as Martin Bloom pointed out too um, and others um, of course Joe and, and, uh, and many people a more unequal world potentially a more dangerous world Jen Fonso right uh, and uh, or uh, 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 Jen um, Nuzo raised it early on the zoonotic diseases and a cycle of pandemics that could very well be getting uh, more dangerous uh, in the future. So um, in all of this, I, I have to say, I am so glad uh, that we have the colleagues from the Asian Development Bank here. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm convinced that as several people also pointed out that there's a dialogue between um, health policy and health security which of course has an important economic dimension i think jen uh jen Nuzo, uh, mentioned that uh that dialogue has to involve an interaction between specialists in healthcare and economists and so, uh, and then, I mean, obviously it has broader policy implications, international implications. So I'm so glad that we have been able to do this sort of a dialogue between the um, Asian Development Bank, beginning with uh, President Asakawa and uh, Sawada-san and uh, uh, Dr. Zveglich and so many and everyone else and then Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'd like to obviously to thank them to the ADB colleagues, thank my Johns Hopkins colleagues, um, our Reisha, our Center for East Asian Studies um, colleagues, faculty, um, that are, have been here, uh, uh, Ambassador Dornsife, Ambassador Shear, but also our, uh, our researchers, young researchers. We have a group called the Coronavirus Policy Research Task Force that has been working uh, since last March on these issues. They're in a study uh, uh, format, uh, really not specialists, but I know they have worked very hard and I've learned a lot as well through this process and I'm certainly appreciative of their support. So um, we've opened many questions. We've discovered that a new world is being born uh, that has, uh, it's a more complex world uh, that can't easily be understood by simply one discipline. So I think uh, this gives us uh, the basis for a broader dialogue and a continued dialogue. And I certainly look forward to that. And also want to thank, we've had a tremendous uh, group here today, um, a large audience that was well over uh, 200 people. And um, it, I thank our, participants, especially those who've stayed with us for a full three hours, um, and thank everyone who's participated here for, uh, for a very meaningful discussion of meeting the challenge of COVID-19. Thank you very much and looking forward to continuing our dialogue.